Hello, Facebook audience. I'm a little early today. If you're watching the archive, uh, fast forward seven minutes, exactly seven minutes. Otherwise, you'll be bored for the next seven minutes. If you're listening live, stay tuned. We will begin at 3.06 p.m. Eastern Time precisely. 2.06 Central, 1.06 Mountain, 12.06 Pacific Time, 11.06 Alaskan Time, and 10.06 a.m. if you're listening in Hawaii. Just got to cover all bases here. Actually, Puerto Rico, I think, is at 4.06. Be back in a bit. Gonna be a good show today. Hey, Mark, do I still have to check TV as well or just radio now? I think just radio. Okay, to get it to like pop up when it's active. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a test run. We're gonna we're gonna check tonight to see what worked and what didn't work. So if anything's not working, uh, make sure you make a note of it. It's Tuesday, September eleventh, two thousand. You got it. I have already. So if you're listening on Facebook, again, we'll be starting in about five minutes from now. So again, hello, Facebook audience. We'll begin in about four minutes. I'm explained further when I'm on the air, but this week is devoted, really the whole week, depending on how much we get through, to the brilliant and heartwarming speech that I was going to say our president, but um, let's just say our former president gave. Um, a few days ago. It was inspiring, if a little sad. Our last American elected president. That's right. Our last elected, our last, that's right. The last president chosen by a majority, chosen by the American people. There you go. The last president chosen by the American people. By a majority of the American people. It was um, four days ago. God, it seems like it, 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 oh, the speech already seems old. <laughs> yeah. The last president chosen by a majority of the last democratically elected president. That's good. Yeah, that, I like that. Mm -hmm. I liked it on the basis of democracy. Hello, Cynthia, Diana, and Steve. Thanks for listening in. We'll start in three minutes.
One minute, folks on Facebook, one minute, we begin. with Mark Levine. All right, Mark, I'm going to pot you up and you go when you're ready. I'm ready. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., Today, of course, is September 11th, 2018, 17 years ago, terrorists attacked uh, New York and Washington, D.C., and uh, American heroes uh, stopped a plane in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and really our country was never the same. We do remember our fallen heroes, but we also remember, and we should always remember, that as horrific as the 3,000 Americans who died that day was 10 times that number or 30,000 Americans die every year at the hands of guns, whether by murder, accident, or suicide. So we do remember our fallen heroes. We've, I've talked a lot about 9-11 in the past. That's not what this show is about today. No, this show is about hope and change. Remember those words? No, think back, think a long time ago. Think back to under two years ago when Barack Obama was president of the United States. It seems like ages ago, doesn't it? Doesn't seem like it was just two years ago. But when I heard President Obama speak a few days back, couldn't help but reminisce, couldn't help but remember the way things were. Now, I've got three shows today. It's going to be a really special week. We've got shows today, Thursday, and Friday. So um, we've got time to really analyze this speech. And I think it's important. I think it's important, one, because I think we focus so much sometimes on Donald Trump that we forget what an intelligent, kind, honest, caring president even sounds like. Heck, sometimes we forget what a sane president sounds like. We forget humor, real humor, sweet humor, not humor that puts down others. We forget intelligence, a president who knows how to discuss complicated concepts and reason with us, reason. I think it's been at least five years, maybe 10 since I took an entire speech and dissected it on this show. I've done it in the past. I remember I did it with Al Gore, how many years ago? 10 years ago. And it was a long speech. The speech was an hour and five minutes long. So it's going to take several days. And we're going to play the speech in its entirety this week. Now you may say, well, Mark, I heard the speech. It was fantastic. Why, why should I sit here and listen to you? on the radio or on Facebook or on Progressive Voices? Well, the answer is I'm not just going to play the speech. I'm going to comment on the speech. So you'll get it annotated with my commentary. But even if you've already heard it once, I think you're going to want to hear it again. What he says is so thoughtful and so intelligent that it's worth reflecting on. And hopefully my comments today will help in that reflection, you're, of course, always welcome to call in as well with your thoughts at 888-48-MARK, 888-486-2275. We will not finish the speech today. We'll go through a good part of it. But 
I don't know about you. When I hear someone give a speech, particularly a political speech, I'm always thinking, okay, yeah, I agree with you there. No, nah, I don't agree with you there. Uh, I agree with you, but that logic really wasn't great. You're on my side, but that's not the argument I would have made. Or I might have expressed it a little bit differently when I heard President Obama Friday, I felt like he was reading my mind, taking my soul and putting it out there. And I know when I can't express anything better. I mean, I work really hard to express myself well, but watching President Obama, he said everything I wanted to say and more. And he said exactly how I wanted to say it. He talked not just about Trump, but the people who support him and the people who support us and the folks on our left and folks who don't vote and all the things that I've been saying now for years encapsulated in one beautiful speech. So I thought, well, you know what? <laughs> when you're watching and listening to the master, I need to shut up and let you hear the 44th president of the United States. There's a lot of wisdom in what he has to say. And if you haven't heard the entire speech, I hope you'll enjoy this well as much as I do. Don't worry though, I'll be I'll be coming in and out and stopping the speech and making comments. I want you to note first that he begins with humor. He begins with the ILL chant for Illinois. That's that's you know, he knows where he is. Not like oh, Trump, who sometimes forgets what place he's in. He knows where he is. He's speaking to a hometown audience. And listen at the beginning, before he says anything meaningful, just the compassion when he speech, speaks, the love, the gentle humor. Barack Obama was never about putting people down. He was always about building people up. Ladies and gentlemen, the 44th president of the United States. Hey. Hello, Illinois. ILL. Okay, just checking to see if you're awake. Please have a seat, everybody. It is good to be home. It's good to see corn, beans. I was trying to explain to somebody as we were flying in. That's corn. That's beans. They were very impressed and my agricultural knowledge. Uh, please give it up for Amari once again for that outstanding introduction. Beautiful young I man. Have, uh, introduced him in a really very nice speech. I have a bunch of good friends here today, including uh, somebody who I served with, uh, who is one of the finest uh, senators in the country, and we're lucky to have him. Uh, your senator, Dick Durbin, is here. I also noticed, by the way, uh, former Governor Edgar here, who I haven't seen in a long time, and somehow he has not aged, and I have. It is great to see you, Governor. This is, by the way, standard politician. I want to thank, you always uh, thank President the people that are Colleen there with and you. Everybody in the room. at the U of I system good manners, for really. making it possible for me to be here today, uh, and I am deeply honored uh, at uh, the Paul Douglas Award that is being given to me. Uh, he is somebody who set the path for so much outstanding public service uh, here in Illinois. Now, I, I want to start by addressing the elephant in the room. I know people are still wondering why I didn't speak at the 2017 commencement. <laughs> the student body president sent a very thoughtful invitation. Students made a spiffy video, and when I declined, I hear there was speculation that I was boycotting campus until Antonio's Pizza reopened. <laughs> so I want to be clear. I did not take sides in that late-night food debate. <laughs> the 
truth is, after eight years in the White House, I needed to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with Michelle if I wanted to stay married. <laughs> and she says hello, by the way. Uh, I also wanted to spend some quality time with my daughters, who were suddenly young women on their way out the door. Uh, and I, I should add, by the way, now that I have a daughter in college, uh, I can tell all the students here, your parents suffer. <laughs> they cry privately. It is brutal. So please call. <laughs> Send a text. <laughs> we need to hear from you. Just a little something. I'm going to stop right there. I found that just so endearing, so sweet, right? He's talking to a, a college audience, reminding them to call home in a very kind way to think of their parents suffering at home without them. You know, it's just basic compassion. Frankly, we probably wouldn't even notice it two, three, five, ten years ago. But in this day and age where we have a president and administration so anxious to tear us into little pieces. It's nice to have a former president who reminds kids to call home and think of their parents. We'll get to the meat of the speech right after the break. If you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275, right back after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal America. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hello, Facebook audience. I guess, um, special Facebook commentary. Mark Romaldi, my wonderful producer, why don't you share with our Facebook audience what you said to me when I told you I was going to play this speech and you heard Obama just, just as we were doing testing for the first time in some time. I, I said it hurt, and it made me feel like I was hearing the voice of a, a girlfriend or a soulmate that got away mm. or that I hadn't heard from in so long. And I forgot the type of emotions that they could make me feel so strong. And, um, uh, I felt pangs in my heart, in my chest. I really did physically, physically felt them. That's, I think that's very powerfully and well put. So I want, I want you to share that with our face. I love them. I do. I, I love, love them too. It's weird, you know, to love. It is. I mean, it is. I mean, I've seen Obama once in my life and it was in a sea of several tens of thousands of people when he accepted the nomination in Denver in 2008. I think that's not true. I once saw him in Washington, D.C. as he was briefly, very briefly, as he came out from the same play I was in, actually, that I'd gone to see. Um, did not know he was in the audience. Um, probably should have known given the, uh, you know, the, the, the big black car around and the, the guys in suits. Um, but um, uh, anyway, but I, I mean, I haven't talked to the man, which is, I mean, I actually, I've talked to and met Bill and Hillary Clinton. I've worked with Hillary Clinton. Uh, I knew her much better, actually. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, he inspires us. And, and yeah, it's um, a lot of love. He brings out the best. He really does. And, and one of the reasons why I'm really, looking forward to sharing the entire speech and i'm playing every word of it folks you're not missing any of it it'll be over over today and thursday and friday is um he also knows how to write a good speech you know it, this isn't one of those discursive trump things that goes off in a thousand different directions it's got its eddies it's got its flows you know he begins thanking people as you must he does a shout out to parents at home but it's a very serious speech and it's a very thoughtful speech and one that made me think of, in fact, 
when I watched it, and I've seen the speech in full already, I'm listening for the second time, I would stop my my TV remote and actually think about what he had to say before I went on. It was so dense and so powerful, and that's why I'm looking forward to stopping it as we go along and, and sharing my thoughts. Um, he's very charitable, and that's hard to be sometimes to uh, those that support the current president. And yet one can be kind to people who are making horrendous choices without allow it, without dignifying the horrendous choices they make. You can dignify the person without dignifying their choices. They will be back shortly. When we come back, he talks about the first president, George Washington. Guess you got to begin somewhere. It's a beautifully written speech. As I, as I look through it and as he segues from one topic to another, it's really well done. I'm ready, Mark. And now, the voice of reason in an All right, Mark, here you go. Mark Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. We're devoting today, Thursday and Friday, entirely to the speech by that kind, honest, sane, rational president of the United States that we used to have. Uh, here, of course, is President Obama. The truth was, I was also intent on following uh, a wise American tradition of ex-presidents gracefully exiting the political stage and making room for new voices and new ideas. And we have our first president, George Washington, uh, to thank for setting that example. After he led the colonies to victory as General Washington, there were no constraints on him, really. He was uh, practically a god to those who had followed him into battle. There was no constitution, there were no democratic norms that guided what he should or could do. And he could have made himself all powerful. He could have made himself potentially president for life. And instead he resigned as commander in chief and moved back to his country as state. And six years later, he was elected president. But after two terms, he resigned again and rode off into the sunset. And the point Washington made, the point that is essential to American democracy, is that in a government of and by and for the people, there should be no permanent ruling class. There are only citizens who through their elected and temporary representatives determine our course and determine our character. Now I want you to notice what he did here. He didn't just begin with the first president in order to begin with the first president. Barack Obama is making a point here, but he's also making several sub points that are just beneath the surface. The, the point is the one, well, why am I speaking, right? Everyone should know when you get up to speak, while you're speaking. He says the tradition is ex-presidents leave the stage. He is breaking that tradition. He's going to explain why. But he begins with the tradition and he begins with George Washington leaving the stage and why he did that and why that's a good thing for democracy. And that's his surface point. But as we look below the surface, we can see there's several other points he's making. And not just the fact that he's quoting not just Washington, but uh, our other greatest American president, Abraham Lincoln, where he talks about government by the people, of the people, and for the people. That's, of course, from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Barack Obama is making the point that this is all larger than one man, that the course of America, the course of our Constitution, the course of our whole enterprise right here in North America is ideas larger than ourselves. When he talks about the fact that George Washington could have been a dictator, could have been a president for life, there were no democratic norms, 
I certainly think he's referring to the current resident in the White House. He's making clear that George Washington did not see himself as above his country. He sacrificed himself for his country. He was commander in chief. He moved back to his country's state. He was elected president, and then he rode off again into the sunset. When Barack Obama says there's no permanent ruling class, he's making clear that government is larger than any one of us. It's a lesson that the current resident of the White House will never learn. I'm here today because this is one of those pivotal moments when every one of us, as citizens of the United States, need to determine just who it is that we are, just what it is that we stand for. And as a fellow citizen, not as an ex-president, but as a fellow citizen, I'm here to deliver a simple message, and that is that you need to vote because our democracy depends on it. Now, some of you may think I'm exaggerating when I say this November's elections are more important than any I can remember in my lifetime. And I know politicians say that all the time. I have been guilty of saying it a few times, particularly when I was on the ballot. <laughs> but just a glance at recent headlines should tell you that this moment really is different. The stakes really are higher. The consequences of any of us sitting on the sidelines are more dire. And it's not as if we haven't had big elections before or big choices to make in our history. The fact is, democracy has never been easy, and our founding fathers argued about everything. We waged a civil war. We overcame depression. We've lurched from eras of great progressive change to periods of retrenchment. Still, most Americans alive today, certainly the students who are here, have operated under some common assumptions about who we are and what we stand for. So now the president has laid out the thesis, the theme of his speech. He's telling you, you got to vote. And his whole speech for the next hour is going to be why you got to vote. And he's going to make an argument. He's going to make a rational argument based on our history, based on who we are. He says it's the most important election in the United States. He concedes that he has said that before, which is a great way to sort of admit that and then move on. But he's going to go through American history. He's going to explain to us why this is different, why we've been through troubles in the past, why we can see it through in the future, but only if we vote. You're not going to want to miss more of this speech. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. My name is Mira Batra. I... I'm sorry, I was listening to you so intently, I almost missed the phrase. Oh, that's okay. I'm watching the <laughs> clock. I am watching the I clock. I know you're always good, but it's funny. <laughs> I'm so used to doing this, and, you know, usually you're very engaging, but I don't know. Today I'm, like, sucked in. <laughs> it's okay. I need to get out in time. I got yes, out for those four who, seconds early. For those, uh, for those of you people. listening on Facebook, you know, as a producer, I've been very fortunate to listen to a lot of great shows and marks, but you know, sometimes just other ones just really get you, you know, and I think it's just this whole moment. Yeah, just pining over Obama, uh, which is okay. It's all right. Yeah, but I think to put it in context the way that you are also makes it easier to do so. You know what I mean? Well, I'm trying to deconstruct the speech a bit um, because I think when you hear it, you can be overwhelmed with that emotion. Oh, there's so many layers when he's right, speaking, that's right, too. That's right. 
So you can be overwhelmed with just the emotion of, oh, Obama, that you don't kind of see how he's taking this apart bit by bit. He begins with, you know, humor and welcome and brings people in. You know, uh, I was in Illinois. I know your fight song. I know your your corn and beans. Uh, remember your parents. I'm like your parents. You well, know. You're so right about the, that touching moment because it's funny. I was on the other end of that, you know. Not too long ago, I say, but really half my life ago was when I first went away to college. And now, you know, my kids are only one in three. But when I miss them, I, I, you know, I really I feel it hard and I can't imagine raising them and then having them go away. And then all of a sudden they just don't write they, they don't love you, but they don't talk to you at all. <laughs> so he's right. But he's of course he's right. Way, but but, but so, here's what's so sweet about it is. It's it's a universal thing, at least yep. you know. I mean, even if even if for kids who don't go to college to have kids move away yeah. from home, oh, yeah. it's a universal thing. And what he's showing is that he's a man of compassion. You know, it just seems like every time exactly. Trump You're speaks, right. it's about him. It's, it's about complete, what can I do to help mm -hmm. me? Blah yep. blah blah. Why am I great? Right. And Obama, I mean, there's going to be politics. You know, it's coming in a speech, but. For a moment, it's just a little bit of human compassion. He's like, you know, exactly. hey, your parents, that's brutal. They're suffering. Listen to the words he used. They're suffering. It's brutal. Kind of brings a little tear to your eye. It like, does. Oh, yeah, like, oh man. call we, your we parents. Call them, you know? <laughs> call your parents. And, and he's going just, through it himself. It's just you know? sweet. So it's he's just, just a real guy. Can yeah. you imagine Trump saying uh, something like no, that impossible. ever? Impossible. No, I would faint. Impossible. And, and there would be news stories about him sounding human. Before you know? we even get into the thrust of his speech, it's like, hey, I'm a human being. You're a human being. We both have compassion for one another. Call mom. Yeah, exactly. Call your mom. And it has nothing to, that has nothing that's to right. do with it's, it's just, he's not it's doing just, it for himself. No, it's he's just doing it for the basic. Parents. That's right. That's right. That's right. And plus, and, Mark, even when he does speak about politics, it really does feel like the reason he's doing it is for the good of the country. Well, that's right. Trump and we're does, gonna get the to reason that. he talks about politics is to serve himself. Exactly, which is why, you know, when he brings up George Washington, that's exactly his it's point. Perfect, this was yeah. a person whose country came first perfect analogy. before himself. And that's why even if the, the, the text of the speech is – George Washington didn't talk, and that's a good thing, and I'm going to violate that. I'm explain why it's important for me to break this rule. The subtext is because George Washington was a man of character and exactly. and uh, someone who wasn't a dictator, even though he could have been. Yeah. Whereas uh, Trump is exactly the opposite. He wants exactly. to be a dictator, but he can't be. That's right. That's um, exactly right. So so it's important to see that the subtext and not just the text. So it's it's it's. Get, I'm getting the feels today, Mark. Yeah. The well. Kids call them. Yeah. It's good it's, though. It's good. That's yeah. what drives people to action. Yeah. 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 And if you haven't registered to vote. Damn it! You better hurry. You better get your. It, that's together. right. It is. It is. It is. It is mid September. Most places st stop after you know after end of September. I'll get a web. There's a web. Red shirt of vote. Yeah. yeah. I'll get, I'll get All right. We'll keep going. All right. Here you go, Mark. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. We've been deconstructing President Obama's speech from last Friday because there's so much beauty in it, so many layers, and so much really to teach us. And one of the things I really like about Obama uh, is that he argues from history. He argues from facts. If you're a regular listener of my show, you know I bring up historical analogies all the time. People joke about, uh, you know, if something happens, no, no, that happened once before in 1843, and I'll give you the example. Because I think we have a lot to learn from history. And I think, yes, it may sound cliche, but it is true that those who don't learn from history, are doomed to repeat it. So it's important to put this moment in context. We're going through hell right now as a country, but we've been through hell before. Civil War, Great Depression, McCarthyism, and we've managed to survive. And so now President Obama turns to our history to put the current moment in its proper context. Out of the turmoil of the Industrial Revolution and the Great Depression, America adapted a new economy, a 20th century economy, guiding our free market with regulations to protect health and safety and fair competition, empowering workers with union movements, investing in science and infrastructure and educational institutions like U of I, 
strengthening our system of primary and secondary education and stitching together a social safety net. And all of this led to unrivaled prosperity and the rise of a broad and deep middle class in the sense that if you worked hard, you could climb the ladder of success. Basically pointing out that liberal values, progressive values worked in the past, helped create the American middle class, helped for our prosperity. It's an argument about the past. And of course, it's also an argument about our future. But Obama is not one of those people who says, oh, and America was always great, right? He's going to turn, as he must, to be honest, and talk about the, well, the darker parts of our history. Now, not everyone was included in this prosperity. There was a lot more work to do. And so in response to the stain of slavery and segregation, and the reality of racial discrimination, the civil rights movement not only opened new doors for African Americans, but also opened up the floodgates of opportunity for women and, and, and Americans with disabilities and LGBT Americans, others to make their own claims to full and equal citizenship. And although discrimination remained a pernicious force in our society and continues to this day, and although there are controversies about how to best ensure genuine equality of opportunity, there's been at least rough agreement among the overwhelming majority of Americans that our country is strongest when Everybody's treated fairly. When people are judged on the merits and the content of their character, and not the color of their skin, or the way in which they worship God, or their last names. And that consensus then extended beyond our borders. And from the wreckage of World War II, we built a post-war web architecture, system of alliances and institutions to underwrite freedom and oppose Soviet totalitarianism and to help poor countries develop. So now he is talking about the past. That's the text. I think we all know what the subtext is. The text is, yes, we had slavery and segregation. We cannot deny the horrors of our past, but we had a civil rights movement opening new doors for African Americans doors the current administration is about to close or trying to close. That's the subtext. Opportunity for women, Americans with disabilities, LGBT Americans, full and equal citizenship. Subtext, we know the president does not believe that all Americans should be treated equally. We know that he has specifically attacked immigrants and women and Americans with disabilities and rainbow Americans points that the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that we're strongest when we're, everyone's treated fairly. And we know that the Trumpists don't believe in fair treatment of their fellow citizens. But again, he's just making the positive argument. Me, Mark Levine, I'm giving you the subtext. I think we know it's coming. He's laying out an argument. He's laying out that these are the norms. These are the norms that um, that we have as a nation. And he's obviously going to point out quite soon that these norms are being violated when um, under the current situation. He even brings up uh, foreign policy, that we care about alliances with democracies, that we want to help freedom, that we want to oppose the evil empire, right? Soviet totalitarianism, Russian totalitarianism. We want to help poor countries develop. We want the whole world to live in freedom. And that's a clear, a clear distinction between the past and the present. Now, what he's about to say just adds another layer to the conversation. He's about to say that the old times weren't perfect. He's about to admit 
as only an honest person can do, that sometimes our wishes to make the whole world live in freedom led to mistakes like, like Vietnam. In other words, he admits that, that it was imperfect. And in doing so, he actually makes a stronger argument. Someone who tells you that the system is good but not perfect is someone you can trust. Someone who tells you the system is absolutely perfect just doesn't ring true. And it, it never is. So by conceding the imperfections, he actually makes a stronger argument for what he said before. Let's listen to him do that. And American leadership across the globe wasn't perfect. We made mistakes. At times, we lost sight of our ideals. We had fierce arguments about Vietnam, and we had fierce arguments about Iraq. But thanks to our leadership, a bipartisan leadership, and the efforts of diplomats and Peace Corps volunteers, most of all, thanks to the constant sacrifices of our men and women in uniform. We not only reduced the prospects of war between the world's great powers, we not only won the Cold War, we helped spread a commitment to certain values and principles, like the rule of law and human rights and democracy, and the notion of the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. Even those countries that didn't abide by those principles were still subject to, to shame and, and still had to at least give lip service to the idea. And that provided a lever to continually improve the prospects for people around the world. That's the story of America. A story of progress. Fitful progress, incomplete progress, but progress. And that progress wasn't achieved by just a handful of famous leaders making speeches. It was one because of countless quiet acts of heroism and dedication by citizens, by ordinary people, many of them not much older than you. It was one because rather than be bystanders to history, ordinary people fought and marched and mobilized and built and, yes, voted to make history. So he's laid it out now. He's finished his historical argument. He's gone through and made clear that while it wasn't perfect, we all looked out for one another. We tried to make the world a better place. We cared about human rights. We cared about human rights at home and all over the world. And even if countries didn't abide by those principles, he said they at least had to give lip service for the idea. We shamed the Soviet Union and the Russians. We weren't praising Nazis. We were fighting Nazis. And he points out that's the story of America, a story of progress, fitful progress, incomplete progress, but progress. He's giving us hope. He's reminding us that we've done it before. And he goes on to say that it's not just a handful of famous leaders making speeches. And it wasn't. For all we talk about Martin Luther King, we need to remember there was a civil rights movement before King and one after he died. It wouldn't have been achieved with just him. It's not about, we are not a country where one person leads the way. We're a country where ordinary people protest and lead the way. Well, whether it's the Women's March or Colin Kaepernick or the March for Our Lives, he's making clear that today's protests, today's fights, today's grassroots, which is stronger now than I can recall in my lifetime. I wasn't around in the 60s for Vietnam and civil rights, I suspect that that's the last time it was this strong. But that this is our country. This is what we're about. This is our history. This is where we belong. He's taking the past and he's bringing it to the present with hope and progress. 
And he's doing all that so that he can contrast it. So he can contrast it with that of Donald Trump. And that's what he's going to do next, right after the break. A call. Well, actually, we won't take calls. We'll just finish the speech today. We'll do calls on Thursday. But we'll be right back right after this. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. Hi, this is John Andrade. So this is our last break. Um, he, President Obama began as he should with hope and joy and progress and reminding us that um, these lessons of our past are very much true in the presence, that the people protesting today, fighting for American values are indeed, we are the children of the past. We're the ones who made America great, as it were, although Barack Obama would never say those words because great is such a such a meaningless term. Oh, that's great. In fact, it's, it's, there's a reason why sarcasm, the word great, I think, is used. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Oh, yeah, that's great. 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 We don't do that with other words so much, right? We don't do that with happy or successful. We don't, we're not sarcastic with that because great is one of those words that it, it has no meaning. It's great. It's just a superlative, an empty superlative, the kind that, I don't know, a child might use. No one says these words anymore, but when I was in my teens, now I'm showing my age, the big word was awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Kind of a stupid word, given that whatever it was we were talking about was never as awesome as perhaps the word deserved. No, Obama's not using words like great. He's actually describing greatness. He's describing people looking out for one another. He's describing progress. Yes, fitful progress. Yes, imperfect progress. He's describing America's past in a way that... Um, reminds us what we can do in the future. And when he comes back, he's going to uh, contrast this with Trump's America. So it's important to start with the positive, I think. It, you know, if you give a speech and you just immediately start attacking somebody, people aren't going to listen to you. But if you bring out the positive vision that we had and but you're trying to bring back, I just think that's a much more persuasive way to, to give a speech. This is a very well-constructed speech. And we'll be back with it and the dark turn our country took in just a few minutes. And given my pace, I may need more than three shows to finish this speech. <laughs> that's okay. You on Facebook get this extra little commentary. Stay tuned. We should be back in just about a minute or two, if I've calculated correctly. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. Welcome, Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, playing President Obama's speech in full today and Thursday and Friday. There's just so much to unpack here. 
President Obama has talked about the progress that's been made up to this point, how that's progress of ordinary citizens helping their country. And he turns then, as he must, to the heart of his speech. And that's how we went off the rails. Of course, there's always been another darker aspect to America's story. Progress doesn't just move in a straight line. There's a reason why progress hasn't been easy. He's, he's tying the present, again, just as he tied our good parts of our present to the past, he's also tying the bad parts of our present to the past. And why throughout our history, every two steps forward seems to sometimes produce one step back. Each time we painstakingly pull ourselves closer to our founding ideals, that all of us are created equal, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Quoting the Declaration of Independence, of course. The ideals that say every child should have opportunity and every man and woman in this country who's willing to work hard should be able to find a job and support a family and pursue their small piece of the American dream. Our ideals that say we have a collective responsibility to care for the sick and the infirm. And we have a responsibility to conserve the amazing bounty, the natural resources of this country and of this planet for future generations. Each economic justice, health care, the environment, basic core progressive principles. Each time we've gotten closer to those ideals, somebody somewhere is pushed back. The status quo pushes back. Sometimes the backlash comes from people who are genuinely, if wrongly, fearful of change. More often, it's manufactured by the powerful and the privileged who want to keep us divided and keep us angry and keep us cynical because that helps them maintain the status quo and keep their power and keep their privilege. And you happen to be coming of age during one of those moments. It did not start with Donald Trump. He is a symptom, not the cause. Critical point. Critical point and something that I've been talking about. He's the symptom, not the cause. Trump is there because we allowed him to be there, because we've had a cynical Republican Party do exactly what he said. A few people are afraid of change. They're afraid of someone who's different. They don't want to, men who don't want to be equal with women, whites who don't want to be equal with blacks, straight people who don't want to be equal with gay people, rich people who don't want poor people to have a, a, a stake in America. But as he says, sometimes the backlash comes from people who are genuinely, if wrongly, fearful of change. More often, he says, it's manufactured by the powerful and the privileged who want to keep us divided and keep us angry and keep us cynical because that helps them maintain the status quo and keep their power and keep their privilege. That is the story of the modern Republican Party. It's exactly who they are and what they've done from Richard Nixon stoking racial fears through Newt Gingrich, through Donald Trump. You know, most Republicans don't believe in Trumpism. The vast majority, including elected officials, tell me behind the scenes, they know he's an idiot. They know he's a narcissist. They know he's corrupt. But they can't tell you that publicly because they're afraid that their brainwashed supporters won't vote for them again. So who tells you the truth? Which Republicans? Well, John McCain before he died. Or Jeff Flake or Bob Corker who are leaving the Senate. It's critical that we understand though that this is not Trumpism is not about Donald Trump any more than uh, Jim Jonesism was about supporting that crazy preacher down in Jonestown, Guyana, who got everyone to drink Kool Aid. There will always be charlatans. There will always be demagogues. 
It's the people who follow them. And it's a society that encourages people to follow demagogues. Donald Trump didn't even create birtherism. This ridiculous notion that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States, that wasn't created by Donald Trump. That was created by other conspiracy theorists. He just capitalized on it. As President Obama put it. He's just capitalizing on resentments that politicians have been fanning for years. A fear and anger that's rooted in our past, but it's also born out of the enormous upheavals that have taken place in your brief lifetimes. And by the way, it is brief. I, when I heard Amari was 11 when I got elected. <laughs> and now he's like started a company. <laughs> that was yesterday. <laughs> but think about it. You've come of age in a smaller, more connected world where demographic shifts and the winds of change have scrambled not only traditional economic arrangements, but our social arrangements and our religious commitments and our civic institutions. Most of you don't remember a time before 9-11 when you didn't have to take off your shoes at an airport. Most of you don't remember a time when America wasn't at war. Or when money and images and information could travel instantly around the globe. Or when the climate wasn't changing faster than our efforts to address it. And this change has happened fast faster than any time in human history. And it created a new economy that has unleashed incredible prosperity. But it's also upended people's lives in profound ways. For those with unique skills or access to technology and capital, a global market has meant unprecedented wealth. For those not so lucky, for the factory worker, or the office worker, or even middle managers, those same forces may have wiped out your job, or at least put you in no position to ask for a raise. So President Obama is pointing out that change is hard, and it's tough on people. And some that times that leads to the resentments lead to a demagogue like Donald Trump. Tune in Thursday for to continue the speech. In corporate world, when trouble pops up and things get sticky. All right, Mark. Awesome show, Mark. I'm looking forward to doing them with you we Thursday and Friday. Keep bud. going Thursday and Friday. I can't remember the last time I did this. I think it was with a speech by Al Gore. Yeah, you were saying Al Gore eight or like nine 10 years, years ago. ago or something. I, I That's think, amazing. Yeah, but sometimes just it, the historical moment is such that we need Completely to listen necessary. to the wisdom of, of a very wise man and to really digest what he has to say. So that's why we're taking it taking it slow so folks absolutely listen come back thursday 3 p.m eastern time same same time same channel and we're gonna keep uh, with more of the speech just let me know when you're ready let's just do a quick mic check um am i too loud am i good You might want to turn yourself down a, a little, All right, a turn. little bit, just, All right. to, just for the posterity. Yeah. All right. Hold on. I'm at a different microphone from where I normally am. All right. You got two minutes of bed. Yeah. Let, right. Let's just do more bed. Yep. I got to get Obama's speech up anyway. It's all good. Yeah. Your website is giving me trouble. So. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason for that, but I don't have no time problem. to explain. At the yeah, it's all right. No worries. Yep, but, uh, you, you sound good though, like really whenever you're ready, man. Okay. Actually, before we start, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I want to make sure you hear this really well. Hold on. Okay. 
you you can't hear this, can you? It's very faint. Are you playing it from like a phone or something? Hold on, no. Yeah, or it might just be a pot thing. Like it's there's always uh, hold on. Been there it is. There it is. Aspect. Yeah, you can even turn that up a little. Okay. For that, I'm getting yeah. Hold on, I can turn it up more. Progress doesn't just move. Better, yeah, that's good. Line. That's good. Should I go even louder? I think that's good. Hasn't is that too loud? Easy. No, that's like perfect. It's and really why it throughout great. our history. Is that really same level as me. Every two steps forward. Yeah, just about. Seems to right. sometimes produce uh, one step. Whenever you're ready, man. Okay. Uh, give me one more second. He's just capitalizing on resentments that politicians have been fanning for years. Yeah, that level sounds great, though. Okay. A fear and anger that's rooted in our past, but it's also born out of the enormous upheavals that have taken place in your endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights taking place in your brief lifetimes. And by the way, it is brief. I, when I heard Amari was 11 when I got a, a global market has meant unprecedented wealth. All right, you ready All right, I'm go? ready. Yeah. All right, you're up. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I am your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. We started on Tuesday to play President Obama's really necessary speech. You recall President Obama kind of left the stage after uh, the election of 2016 we were all in shock and horror, and our hope, our dream, left us. Well, he was required by the Constitution to do that. The 22nd Amendment does not allow a president to serve more than two terms. But most presidents do tend to sort of go off the stage and leave it to the next guy, and that would normally be the right thing to do, except that we don't live in any normal times whatsoever. So President Obama is back before the midterm elections, helping us understand what's going on and really, I think, showing that mixture of intelligence and compassion and wisdom that we haven't seen in the presidency for a long time. And that's why uh, today and tomorrow, uh, just like Tuesday, I'll be playing his speech. I'll be commenting on it because, well, sometimes I have to admit that uh, – it said much better other than outside of me, and I cannot have put it better. I, it's rare that I agree with every single thing a politician says, but in this case, I do. Every single thing he said in this speech, uh, pretty much, I, I just, just rings true to me. So I want to play for you more, if you missed the speech or even if you heard it, to really delve into why it's exactly what we need to hear right now. So we'll continue where we left off before. For those not so lucky, for the factory worker, or the office worker, or even middle managers, those same forces may have wiped out your job, or at least put you in no position to ask for a raise. And as wages slowed and inequality accelerated, those at the top of the economic pyramid have been able to influence government to skew things even more in their direction. Cutting taxes on the wealthiest Americans, unwinding regulations and weakening worker protections, shrinking the safety net. So you have come of age during a time of growing inequality a fracturing of economic opportunity. And that growing economic divide compounded other divisions in our country, regional, racial, religious, cultural. It made it harder to build consensus on issues. It made politicians less willing to compromise, which increased gridlock, which made people even more cynical about politics. Again, what President Obama is doing is he's going through the history, uh, the recent history that we've all lived through, and explaining why we have these great divisions that we have today, reminding us of the, the economic factors that were around when he became president 
that are quite different from the economic factors that were around when Trump became president. And then the reckless behavior of financial elites triggered a massive financial crisis. 10 years ago this week, a crisis that resulted in the worst recession in any of our lifetimes and caused years of hardship for the American people. For many of your parents, for many of your families. Most of you weren't old enough to, to fully focus on what was going on at the time. He's talking to uh, the University of Illinois students. So when he says that, says that, at least you know who he's talking to. But when I came into office in 2009, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. 800,000. Millions of people were losing their homes. Many were worried we were entering into a second Great Depression. So we worked hard to end that crisis, but also to break some of these longer term trends. And the actions we took during that crisis returned the economy to healthy growth and initiated the longest streak of job creation on record. And we covered another 20 million Americans with health insurance and we cut our deficits by more than half, partly by making sure that people like me, who've been given such amazing opportunities by this country, pay our fair share of taxes to help <laughs> folks coming up behind me. And by the time I left office, household income was near its all-time high, and the uninsured rate had hit an all-time low, and wages were rising, and poverty rates were falling. Uh, I mention all this just so when you hear how great the economy is doing right now, <laughs> let's just remember uh, when this recovery started. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's continued, but when you hear about this economic miracle that's been going on, when the job numbers come out, monthly job numbers, and suddenly Republicans are saying it's a miracle. I had to kind of remind them, actually, those job numbers are the same as they were in 2015 and 2016. And Anyway, I digress. <laughs> so we made progress, but, and this is the truth, my administration couldn't reverse 40-year trends in only eight years, especially once Republicans took over the House of Representatives in 2010 and decided to block everything we did even things they used to support. So we pulled the economy out of crisis, but to this day, too many people who once felt solidly middle class still feel very real and very personal economic insecurity. And that's a very important point that he's been making. Uh, yes, he, he makes his point about, uh, you know, the economic trends. And by the way, President Obama did an amazing thing uh, during the great Bush recession. The trends in 2007, 2008, a lot of folks don't realize this, were sharper and worse than the trends of 1929, 1930. Had President Obama not become president when he did, had he not done what he did to stimulate the economy, uh, most economic historians believe it would have been worse than the Great Depression because what slid into the, uh, the Depression of 2008 was actually worse than 1929. So he has a right to take a victory lap. I remember the time talking about uh, why we needed to have easy money for the Federal Reserve, why we needed a fiscal stimulus. And Republicans, you may recall at that time, supported Herbert Hoover's strategy the exact same strategy that took the bad news of 1929 and turned it into the Great Depression that lasted all the way until Franklin Delano Roosevelt took power. It is no coincidence that Franklin Roosevelt is 
when the nation started coming out of the Great Depression in 1933. The time to spend, the time to go into debt even, is when we're in a massive recession. The worst time to go into debt, by the way, is when times are really good. Because after President Obama took us out of the Great Recession, when times are really good, if you spin then and you go into debt then, then all you do is lead to great inflation. That's actually the mistake Lyndon Johnson should have learned in the Vietnam era. You don't spend uh, a lot of money and go into massive debt and have massive tax cuts at a time when unemployment is low. And in fact, uh, Johnson's mistake led us to the great stagflation, high unemployment and high inflation of the 1970s. That's exactly where Trump is leading us now. But President Obama has every right to take a victory lap. But his point is not about that, really. As he said, he digresses. His point really is about the economic insecurity that is causing people to be so worried. And let's face it, when we get to the divisions of class and race and prejudice that he's about to talk about, those divisions are exacerbated in times of economic insecurity. I mean, lest we forget, it was the 1930s in Germany and in the United States, the hard times of the Great Depression here, and yes, the hyperinflation and hard times of Germany following World War I, that led to demagogues taking power. Uh, if the Germans weren't so economically depressed, they may not have looked to a demagogue like Adolf Hitler. In America, we had people like Charles Lindbergh, a former American hero, talking about America first and very much preaching hatred of Jews and minorities. We had radio priests. Think about this when you compare it to Rush Limbaugh. People like Father Charles Coughlin. People don't even know who this guy was anymore. But Father Coughlin was a radio priest, and he would get on air and preach demagoguery and hatred, much like what well, you'd hear from Rush Limbaugh or Alex Jones today. Economic insecurity often leads to prejudice. It leads to riling people up. And President Obama's next point when we come back from break is how the Republicans have used this economic insecurity to increase the divisions already existing in America on the basis of class and especially race and ethnicity. You want to hear more from that when we come back. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. We'll be right back right after this. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He, Mark Levine, give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Okay, I have Okay, I have switched microphones now. Okay, your mic sounded great, the one you were using. So. I, I know, but uh, this is the position that they Better normally for... prefer me in the studio. Um, it, do I sound okay on this mic? I can turn it up. You might want to turn it up uh, slightly, yeah, but you sounded great. All, all your levels were awesome. Great audio. I got to answer the phone. Hang tight. All right, sure. Um, I, do you want me to try to message you on Gmail or what do you think will work? Yeah. Um, Steve, what's your name for, what's your email for Gmail? S M as in Michael T R I P I. Yep. At gmail.com. 
I'm going to hit you up a new way here. Great, thanks. Hmm. Eh, kind of off topic, but he's a new caller, so I'll I'll take yeah, him. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with him either. He's still there, so. All right, I'll I'll take him. We're gonna have a very brief segment yeah, right I now. I told him that too, so. That's fine. Um, uh, we are in delay, so I think it's weird. Yeah, um, no, it's 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 fine. It should be fine. We're coming back, man. million dollars each and that's what the trump plan really is all about when conservatives attack mark levine is ready let me know when you're ready mark. ready in hand. and here's our favorite lawyer now you're up welcome back to the inside scoop i'm your host mark levine and we're going through president obama's really very powerful speech uh we've missed him <laughs> uh, talking about the real crises america faces and um why this administration is something that, well, really isn't up to the task. Got a call on the line, line three, Tony in Waterford, Michigan. How are you, Tony? I'm well. How are you, Waterford? I'm doing all right. Good. First of all, I think you should use the term congressional election rather than midterm election. Okay. I mean, there's congressional all, elections every two years. Uh, they're congressional elections the same years as the presidential election. So the reason people say midterm is to distinguish between the four year and, you know, the the off year. But okay. Yeah, but 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 it, it's more of a congressional election than it is a midterm election. A midterm election doesn't carry the same weight with people as hearing congressional election. No, I mean, I mean, here, I think it's the greatest election in our, in our lifetimes because this is the only chance the American people have to stop a wannabe dictator from taking power. So I think I that's agree. a very powerful thing. Uh, and so, um, you know, you can call it the anti-Trump election if you like. Call it anything you like. Um, uh, but I really call it the midterm election. I mean, I'm sorry, the congressional election. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, you want to make a point about President Obama? Yes. Why did he not campaign harder during the 2010 and 2014 congressional elections? See, I remember him campaigning pretty hard. I know that um, I some Democrats didn't want him around. Uh, you got to remember that in 2010, we had the, the remains of the Bush recession, just like now in 2018, we have the remains of the, of the Obama recovery. It takes more than two years to make economic change. In 2010, we were still living off of George Bush's recession, just as in 2018, we're still living off of Obama's great economy. And um, his uh, poll numbers were down. They're not down as low as Donald Trump's. But um, I remember being on Fox News and them asking me why Obama's poll numbers were so low. And I said, it's because the unemployment level is high. So I think sometimes Democrats didn't want him around. But um, I don't I don't recall Obama not going where he was wanted do you yes i do recall that really I, where I, I wonder where where he was i expected him to campaign harder and be out and 
public more often and give more speeches, and he was not as active as I expected him to be. And that's why I think we lost the House in 2010. Yeah, I think um, I, I remember 2010. I was on the air in 2010, and it was a red wave. I think we're heading for a blue wave now. And I think the red wave was put up by, you know, um, pseudo grassroots groups like Tea Party that was put up by, I mean, remember their big deal was the deficit, which is, of course, you don't hear them now talking about the debt because uh, now actually it's a bad time to go into debt. Um, and they, we had a high unemployment levels, And so I think it was kind of leading to a red wave. I, I don't blame President Obama for that. Um, you may, uh, I don't, I, at any point, it's all hindsight. And I think what I really like about him now is that he's focusing on, on the future and how to stop President Trump. Thanks for your call, Tony. We'll be right back with more of Obama's speech right after this. <laughs> there are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at this. I'm going to move it to another point in the speech. So. I'm playing him, but it's, well, Facebook audience can hear it. Even though we took out bin Laden and wound down the wars in Iraq and our combat role in Afghanistan and got Iran to halt its nuclear program, the world's still full of threats and disorder that come streaming through people's televisions every single day. And these challenges get people worried, and it frays our civic trust. We'll be back shortly, folks. By the way, um, just so, again, just for the Facebook audience, I'm, of course, uh, reporting from Washington, D.C. And um, while Hurricane Florence is sort of heading our way, it has taken a dramatic turn to the south. Um, that's good for us in D.C. and Northern Virginia. It is certainly less good for the people of South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, they're taking the biggest hit. And certainly we are looking out for them. Uh, but uh, to all those who've been worried about us up here, I think we're just going to have a bad rainstorm. Um, but uh, if you live in around Wilmington or Myrtle Beach or um, uh, really any of the coast, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, any of the Carolina coast, I hope you're heeding mandatory evacuation. Uh, it's coming. And it's due to climate change, one of the most severe storms we've seen. So um, and we're going to get these a lot more frequently. This is, you know, they don't usually go this far north. Um, they're doing it, obviously, because of the extra heat and energy in the ocean caused by, yep, climate change, which this administration is doing its best to exacerbate. In fact, um, just this week, they were looking at reducing regulations on methane um, emissions from oil and gas platforms. Methane is one of the major causes of the carbon dioxide that causes our planet to warm up. And in order to save a little bit of money for shareholders or CEOs. Okay, Mark, we're coming back. 30 seconds. All right. I recognize that you've described some because of that. Because of that, we're, um, we, we are facing these, these greater hurricanes. So stay safe. Get out of the flood route. And we'll be back uh, just a few seconds, as you heard, to talk, to play more of President Obama's speech.
Progressive. Mark Levine. Let me know when you're ready, man. Ready. You're up. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. President Obama really gave a very powerful speech last week, and it's important to listen to every word of it. It's important to hear all he had to say. There's so much wisdom in it, and unlike a Trump speech that sort of goes all over the place and doesn't really say anything, President Obama packs a lot in, in tight words. So he's talked about the division, the economic division that causes so much insecurity, and now he goes, as he must, to the divisions of race, class and ethnicity that have been so hyped by the Republican Party and have so further divided the American people. And it makes a lot of people feel like the fix is in and the game is rigged and nobody's looking out for them, especially those communities outside our big urban centers. And even though your generation is the most diverse in history, with a, a greater acceptance and celebration of our differences than ever before, those are the kinds of conditions that are ripe for exploitation by politicians who have no compunction and no shame about tapping into America's dark history of racial and ethnic and religious division. Appealing to tribe Appealing to fear, pitting one group against another, telling people that order and security will be restored if it weren't for those who don't look like us or don't sound like us or don't pray like we do. That's an old playbook. It's as old as time. And in a healthy democracy, it doesn't work our antibodies kick in and people of goodwill from across the political spectrum call out the bigots and the fear mongers and work to compromise and get things done and promote the better angels of our nature. But when there's a vacuum in our democracy, when we don't vote, when we take our basic rights and freedoms for granted, when we turn away and stop paying attention and stop engaging and stop believing and look for the newest diversion, the, the electronic versions of bread and circuses, then other voices fill the void. A politics of fear and resentment and retrenchment takes hold and demagogues promise simple fixes to complex problems. No promise to fight for the little guy, even as they cater to the wealthiest and most powerful. No promise to clean up corruption and then plunder away. They start undermining norms that ensure accountability and try to change the rules to entrench their power further. And they appeal to racial nationalism that's barely veiled, if veiled at all. Sound familiar? This is a really important point, and it's one that bears repeating. When we get complacent, we get in trouble. That's clearly what happened in 2016. As he says, when we take our basic rights and freedoms for granted, when we don't vote, when we turn away, stop paying attention, look for the latest diversion, bread and circuses, other voices fill the void. A politics of fear and resentment. Demagogues promising simple fixes to complex problems. <laughs> Is there any other better description of Donald Trump? Simple fixes. It'll all be great. I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do it because I don't know, but it'll all be great. And it's all perfect. And even if I kill 3,000 people in Puerto Rico by my incompetence, I did great. Promise to fight for the little guy as they cater to the wealthiest. Promise to clean up corruption and then plunder away. Has, has there been a more corrupt administration in American history ever? 
I mean, go back to Ulysses Grant or Warren Harding. Mm, I think Trump's more corrupt because it's the president himself that's corrupt, not just the people around him. And yeah, they appeal to racial nationalism. They appeal, he's, he's nicer than I, I mean, they appeal to racism. At the heart of Trumpism is racism. It always has been, it always will be. Now he points out this hasn't only been a Republican thing, it's just a Republican thing, well, for the last 50 years. I understand this is not just a matter of Democrats versus Republicans or liberals versus conservatives. At various times in our history, this kind of politics has invected both parties. Southern Democrats were the bigger defenders of slavery. It took a Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, to end it. Dixiecrats filibustered anti-lynching legislation, opposed the idea of expanding civil rights. And although it was a Democratic president and a majority Democrat Congress, spurred on by young marchers and protesters, they got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act over the finish line. Those historic laws also got passed because of the leadership of Republicans like Illinois' own Everett Dirksen. So neither party has had a monopoly on wisdom. Neither party has been exclusively responsible for us going backwards instead of forwards. But I, but I have to say this, because sometimes we hear, oh, a plague on both your houses. Over the past few decades, wasn't true when Jim Edgar was a governor here in Illinois, or Jim Thompson was governor. Got a lot of good Republican friends here in Illinois. But over the past few decades, the politics of division and resentment and paranoia has unfortunately found a home in the Republican Party. Now, that's just a fact, and it's an important one, particularly when you see Republicans say, but wait, Democrats were the party of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, they were in the 1920s. Well into the 1960s, Dixiecrats opposed civil rights. It was around the time of Franklin Roosevelt, increased, increasingly by the time of John F. Kennedy, by the time of Lyndon Johnson, that there were two Democratic parties, a progressive one and a racist one. And the progressive Democrats beat out the racist Democrats, and the racist Democrats got so mad they left the party and became Republicans, thus sullying the great name of Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, other progressive Republicans. You don't hear those terms anymore progressive Republicans. Richard Nixon wanted George Wallace's voters. George Wallace's voters were Democrats, but they didn't like the civil rights of Lyndon Johnson, so they formed their own third party, and George Wallace got more than any third party candidate, certainly an electoral count, um, since Teddy Roosevelt, 1912. Nixon smartly, evilly, but smartly wanted to appeal to those racist Democrats and bring those race. He knew he couldn't change their racism, but he could change their party label. And that's when a whole bunch of Southern Democrats switched parties and became Republicans. It was called the Southern strategy. So no one should deny the racist past of the Democratic Party, but since the 60s and the 70s, that racist past has been fully accepted, warmly embraced, and actively promulgated by today's Republican Party. To be fair, the Republican Party isn't only about racism. It's also about helping rich people at the expense of poor people, helping polluters at the expense of science. Well, President Obama explains all that when he continues his speech. This Congress has 
championed the unwinding of campaign finance laws to give billionaires outside influence over our politics. Systematically attacked voting rights to make it harder for young people and minorities and the poor to vote. <laughs> Handed out tax cuts without regard to deficits. Slashed the safety net wherever it could. Cast dozens of votes to take away health insurance from ordinary Americans. Embraced wild conspiracy theories like those surrounding Benghazi, or my birth certificate, <laughs> rejected science, rejected facts on things like climate change, embraced a rising absolutism from a willingness to default on America's debt by not paying our bills to a refusal to even meet much less consider a qualified nominee for the Supreme Court because he happened to be nominated by a Democratic president. None of this is conservative. I don't, I don't mean to pretend I, I, I'm channeling Abraham Lincoln now, but that's not what he had in mind, I think when he helped form the Republican Party. It's not conservative. It sure isn't normal. It's radical. It's a vision that says the protection of our power and those who back us is all that matters even when it hurts the country. It's a vision that says the few who can afford high-priced lobbyists and unlimited campaign contributions set the agenda. And over the past two years, this vision is now nearing its logical conclusion. Actually, I would go farther than President Obama because they have used their manipulation of the system to make sure that they, as a minority, have power, whether by gerrymandering all the state lines. Let's not forget that a majority of Americans support Democrats in the House of Representatives, support Democrats in the United States Senate. A majority of Americans preferred Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. We've won the presidency, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, if you just count the number of people who voted. But given some flaws in our system, like the Electoral College, and given the way that Republicans have intentionally gerrymandered boundaries, they are in control even though they're a minority party. And there's a word, it's actually a Dutch word, Afrikaans word, to describe a minority ruling over a majority. That word is apartheid, and that's the country in which we live today, an apartheid country. And the only way that the majority of Americans will take power again is if a supermajority vote, because we still have power for a supermajority to undo, to, 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 to overwhelm all the electoral tricks Republicans have, like taking away people's rights to vote, making it really hard for African Americans to vote, making it hard for poor people to vote, making it hard for Democrats to vote, students, young people to vote. President Obama goes on to talk about how Republican foreign policy is so different from the way it was in the past. So that with Republicans in control of Congress and the White House, without any checks or balances whatsoever, They've provided another $1.5 trillion in tax cuts to people like me, who I promise don't need it. <laughs> and don't even pretend to pay for them. It's supposed to be the party supposedly of fiscal conservatism. Suddenly, deficits do not matter. Even though just two years ago, when the deficit was lower, they said, I couldn't afford to help working families or seniors on Medicare because the deficit was an existential crisis. What changed? What, what changed? They're subsidizing corporate polluters with taxpayer dollars allowing dishonest lenders to take advantage of veterans and students and consumers again. 
They've made it so that the only nation on earth to pull out of the global climate agreement. It's not North Korea, it's not Syria, it's not Russia or Saudi Arabia. It's us, the only country. There are a lot of countries in the world. We're the only ones. They're undermining our alliances, closing up to Russia. What happened to the Republican Party? Its central organizing principle in foreign policy was the fight against communism, and now they're closing up to the former head of the KGB. actively blocking legislation that would defend our elections from Russian attack. What happened? Their sabotage of the Affordable Care Act has already cost more than 3 million Americans their health insurance. And if they're still in power next fall, you better believe they're coming at it again. They've said so. In a healthy democracy, there's some checks and balances on this kind of behavior, this kind of inconsistency. But right now, there's nothing. Republicans who know better in Congress, and they're there, they're quoted saying, yeah, we know this is kind of crazy, are still bending over backwards to shield this behavior from scrutiny or accountability or consequence seem utterly unwilling to find the backbone to safeguard the institutions that make our democracy work. And by the way, that the claim that everything will turn out okay because there are people inside the White House who secretly aren't following the president's orders that is not a check. I'm being serious here. That's not how our democracy is supposed to work. These people aren't elected. They're not accountable. They're not doing us a service by actively promoting 90% of the crazy stuff that's coming out of this White House and then saying, don't worry, we're preventing the other 10%. That's not how things are supposed to work. This is not normal. We'll be back with more of President Obama's speech right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal America. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hi, this is John Andrasik of Five for Fighting, here for RAD. I hope you're enjoying this uh, Facebook audience. Uh, we, uh, it, it's probably been 10 years since I've played a full speech, a full long speech by a politician. But I think there's so much in here that we really need uh, to listen to. It's the kind of thing, frankly, that I would have said, but President Obama, you said it better. And it's important to recognize why we are where we are, if we're ever going to get out of it. And when he comes back, he tells us how to get out of it.
Boy, an hour goes quickly when you're listening to President Obama, doesn't it? it certainly does for me. Do you remember when we had a rational, intelligent, wise president? We did. We used to have one not that long ago. Steve, how much time do I have in the last segment? Just about 90 seconds, maybe. Maybe. Minute. Minute and 90 seconds. That's all I've got? Yeah, it's not much. All right. Then I really don't have time for Michael. Sorry, Michael. No, it's all good. Yeah, you'll have just about two minutes. Let's call it two minutes. Well, I could give him. I'm only going to play another. I'm fine without Michael. 30 I'll put it that seconds. Way. No, I... <laughs> he's on every. He's on more than I am. I run this show. No, I know. I never he, get any airtime. He, he is on a lot. Um, all right. Tell him I'm going to just play the speech. Yeah, that's fine, dude. Okay. I would, Obama, he, it's really good, Mark. Yeah. Really good stuff. Good. All right, we're coming back, man. Nursesunited.org. Strong, this strong show. This podcast is powered by National Nurses United, the nation's largest union for registered nurses. Got a conservative who casually misquotes the Bible and the Constitution? All right, let me know when you're ready, man. Ready. Into school yeah, two with Mark Levine. You're up. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. President Obama laid out a searing indictment of what this current administration is about. And he's going to talk more. We're going to play more of it tomorrow. So make sure you tune in tomorrow again at 3 o'clock. But in just a few words, he tells us there is a solution. There is a way out. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it may seem obvious, but it's important to remember it. So these are extraordinary times. And they're dangerous times. But here's the good news. In two months, we have the chance, not the certainty, but the chance, to restore some semblance of sanity to gracefully act. Oh, my, my thing went out. I will, I will read to his speech. In two months, we have the chance, not the certainty, but the chance to restore some semblance of sanity to our politics, because there's actually only one real check on bad policy and abuses of power, and that's you, you and your vote. Uh, that's uh, where I was going to end it for the day. Um, I'll be more back to play more of President Obama tomorrow, but he's right, of course. The only real check we have is our vote. And honestly, we need more than a majority, given gerrymandering and given the taking away people's right to vote that they're doing all across America, particularly in the Midwest. We got to get a super vote. Ten seconds. You need to get to vote and get out people to vote. This is our only chance. See you tomorrow. McGruff the crime dog here. I deal with a lot of criminal types, and lately, more of them are identity thieves. Okay, great job, Mark. All right, right thanks, Steve. Hey, Mark, I said... Are liberals versus conservatives. Hello again, Facebook audience. We are going to try to complete President Obama's speech today. Um, he said so many really powerful things. Let me let me get started. We haven't, we'll start about one minute, Facebook audience. Conservatives. Jim Edgar was a governor here in Illinois, a qualified nominee for the Supreme Court because he happened to be nominated by a Democratic president. None of this is conservative. I don't I'm corporate polluters with taxpayer dollars. Levine. Allowing dishonest lenders to take advantage of veterans and students and consumers again. Let me know when you're ready. They seconds. made it so that no problem. Saying, yeah, we know this is kind of crazy. Are still bending over backwards to shield this behavior from scrutiny or accountability or consequence. I'm ready. You're up. 
Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. We're going back, uh, this is my promise all this week, to go back to President Obama's really path-breaking speech. It's not so much that what he says is new or different. It's that it's just a beautiful consolidation of all the things that, well, he's been thinking and I've been thinking for the last couple of years. And, of course, a call to action, a call to vote. But what I like so much about the speech is how he really explains where we are, how we got there, and, well, where we're going. And let me get right back to the speech. Seem utterly unwilling to find the backbone to safeguard the institutions that make our democracy work. And, by the way, the, the claim that everything will turn out okay because there are people inside the White House who secretly aren't following the president's orders. <laughs> that is not a check. I'm being serious here. That's not how our democracy is supposed to work. These people aren't elected. They're not accountable. They're not doing us a service by actively promoting 90% of the crazy stuff that's coming out of this White House, and then saying, don't worry, we're preventing the other 10%. That's not how things are supposed to work. This is not normal. So these are extraordinary times. And they're dangerous times. But here's the good news. In two months, we have the chance, not the certainty, but the chance, to restore some semblance of sanity to our politics. Because there is actually only one real check on bad policy and abuses of power, and that's you. You and your vote. This is where I concluded yesterday. Um, we will play the rest of the speech today. Again, sometimes the best thing I can do to talk radio host is get out of the way and listen to a master. But listen to how President Obama lays out the vision. It's not just we support democracy, we support free speech, we oppose a simpleton who is our president and is appealing to racism. The Democratic Party has real values. I always hate it when people say, well, what does the Democrats stand for? If you don't know what the Democrats stand for, you're not listening. So please listen now. Look, uh, Americans will always have disagreements on policy. This is a big country. It is a raucous country. People have different points of view. I happen to be a Democrat. I support Democratic candidates. I believe our policies are better and that we have a bigger, bolder vision of opportunity and equality and justice and inclusive democracy. We know there are a lot of jobs young people aren't getting a chance to occupy or, or, or aren't getting paid enough or, or aren't getting benefits like insurance. It's harder for young people to save for a rainy day, let alone retirement. So Democrats aren't just running on good old ideas like a higher minimum wage. They're running on good new ideas like Medicare for all, giving workers seats on corporate boards, reversing the most egregious corporate tax cuts to make sure college students graduate debt free. Let me just quickly say that I don't recall the president so explicitly saying he supports Medicare for all before. I'm really glad to see it. Medicare for all is not some Bernie Sanders socialist idea. With all due respect to you, Bernie Sanders supporters out there, yes, he supports it, but a lot of mainstream Democrats support it too. In fact, I would venture to say the majority of the Democrats, the majority of the Democratic Party now supports Medicare for all. We actually tried to do it and came really close to doing it during the Affordable Care Act years. We didn't have enough senators to break the filibuster, in my view, the Republicans have killed the filibuster, so if we ever take power again, and I think we will if you vote in 2018, then in 2020, I think a Democratic Senate, House, and President can finally pass Medicare for All. These are not out 
of the way impossible dreams. These are realities. Virtually every other nation on earth, and indeed every industrialized nation on earth, does have Medicare for all, does have universal health care, and they all live longer than we do and pay less than half the cost of health care that we do. I think they're doing something right. We know that people are tired of toxic corruption and that democracy depends on transparency and accountability. So Democrats aren't just running on good old ideas like requiring presidential candidates to release their tax returns and barring lobbyists from making campaign contributions, but on good new ideas like barring lobbyists from getting paid by foreign governments. We know that climate change isn't just coming, it is here. So Democrats aren't just running on good old ideas like increasing gas mileage in our cars, which I did and which Republicans are trying to reverse, but on good new ideas like putting a price on carbon pollution. We know that in a smaller, more connected world, we can't just put technology back in a box. We can't just put walls up all around America. Walls don't keep out threats like terrorism or disease. And that's why we propose leading our alliances and, and helping other countries develop and pushing back against tyrants. And Democrats talk about reforming our immigration system, so yes, it is orderly and it is fair and it is legal, but it continues to welcome strivers and dreamers from all around the world. That's, that's why I'm a Democrat. That, that's a set of ideas that I believe in. But I am here to tell you that even if you don't agree with me or Democrats on policy, even if you believe in more libertarian economic theories, even if you are an evangelical and our position on certain social issues uh, is a bridge too far, even if you, you think my assessment of immigration is, is mistaken and, and the Democrats aren't serious enough about immigration enforcement, I'm here to tell you that you should still be concerned with our current course and should still want to see a restoration of honesty and decency and lawfulness in our government. Now, this is a really important point that he's segueing to right now. Yes, there are differences between Democrats and Republicans. He just mentioned all of them. You know, we support health care for all. We support cleaning up pollution. We support fighting against climate change. Um, we don't believe in taking every last bit of American uh, wealth and wringing it dry and giving it all to multinational corporations. But even if you disagree with us on this, even if you don't believe that all Americans deserve civil rights, even if you hate immigrants, you should still agree with the rule of law. Republicans used to support the rule of law. They used to support the Constitution of the United States. They used to venerate the Constitution of the United States. As President Obama is about to point out, it's this rule of law that separates the parties more than anything else. It's this rule of law that is the reason why moderates, independents, and yes, some Republicans are going to pull the lever for Democrats this fall. Because even if they disagree with liberal policies, they still believe that our country has some basic values of constitutional democracy, that justice should be blind, that free speech should be real, that the press should not be censored. Powerful stuff, and he's about to get into it right now. It should not be Democratic or Republican. It should not be a partisan issue to say that we do not pressure the Attorney General or the FBI to use the criminal justice system as a cudgel to punish our political opponents. or to explicitly call on the Attorney General to protect members of our own party from persecution, prosecution because an election happens to be coming up. 
I'm, I'm not making that up. It's, he's not. That's not hypothetical. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say that we don't threaten the freedom of the press because they say things or publish stories we don't like. I complain plenty about Fox News. But you never heard me threaten to shut them down or call them enemies of the people. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say we don't target certain groups of people based on what they look like or how they pray. We are Americans. We're supposed to stand up to bullies. Another, not follow them. Another important point. Are we a country for all we're, or just a we're, few? We're supposed to stand up to discrimination. And we're sure as heck supposed to stand up clearly and unequivocally to Nazi sympathizers. How hard can that be, saying that Nazis are bad? <laughs> now, I'll be honest. Sometimes I get into arguments with progressive friends about what the current political movement requires. There are well-meaning folks passionate about social justice who think things have gotten so bad, the lines have been so starkly drawn, that we have to fight fire with fire. We have to do the same things to the Republicans that they do to us, adopt their tactics. Say whatever works. Make up stuff about the other side. I don't agree with that. It's not because I'm soft. It's not because I'm interested in promoting an, an empty bipartisanship. I don't agree with it because eroding our civic institutions and our civic trust and, and making people angrier and, and yelling at each other and making people cynical about government, that always works better for those like who I am don't believe in the power of collective action. Four. You don't need an effective government or a robust press or reasoned debate to work when all you're concerned about is maintaining power. In fact, the more cynical people are about government, the angrier and more dispirited they are about the prospects for change, the more likely the powerful are able to maintain their power. But we believe that in order to move this country forward, to actually solve problems and make people's lives better, we need a well-functioning government. Let me, let me just pause right there. And I'll tell you what, I'll take this up after the break, but his point about whether or not Democrats should become more like Republicans and be angrier. And I think he's mostly right, but I got a little quibble. I'll tell you about it after the break. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. My name is Dale Pazinski. I'm 19 years old. Hmm. Uh, I appreciate Mark's call from San Francisco, but I think it's kind of off point and i want to finish uh president obama today right i kind of explained that i think that that was the case so we could just i could just screen him out today that's fine yeah um i, I i'm gonna tell him i'm pushing to finish the speech today yeah no absolutely i understand no, no that makes sense yeah. no worries and michael the same yeah 
it's a little off topic. But he can call back next week, call back next Monday, and I, I'd be happy to chat with him about it. Gotcha. We need our civic institutions to work, even the power of collective action. So hello, Facebook audience. I hope you're enjoying listening to this speech again as much as I am. Um, I'll be commenting throughout. Not taking many calls today. Sorry about that. I'm trying to finish the speech today. That way on Monday we can move on to interesting things like uh, Paul Manafort uh, pleading guilty, which he did today. But I think this speech is an important one. It's rare that I do an entire show or shows on a single speech. But I really think it defines the questions for our time. We'll be right back in a few minutes. Coming back. Okay. dot org slash forgotten back to the aggressive progressive mark levine let me know when you're ready ready you're up welcome back to the inside scoop i'm your host mark levine playing president obama's speech from last week which i think laid out the challenges for the day he said something very interesting that i could arguably quibble with he, he says that he has some disagreements with some folks on his left, some folks passionate about social justice, who quote, things have gotten, think things have gotten so bad, we have to fight fire with fire. We have to do the same things to the Republicans they do to us, adopt their tactics, say whatever works, make up stuff about the other side. So I don't agree with making up stuff about the other side. Frankly, the other side does enough atrocious things that making up stuff would be counterproductive. I remember when I lambasted the 9-11 conspiracy theory said Bush Cheney are doing awful things. We don't have to make up stuff about them. So I certainly don't believe in saying whatever works. But in terms of adopting their tactics, you know, sometimes we do have to fight fire with fire, President Obama. And when you have, for example, a Republican Party that's willing to end the filibuster to force down our throats a um, allegedly uh, sexually molesting um, right-wing ideologue who won't even disclose more than 10% of his documents showing that he wants to overturn Roe v. Wade and put children into cages, you know, um, about time we end the filibuster on the other side. Sometimes I think Democrats are so careful not to erode our civic institutions that we basically allow them to have power when we don't. 
I'm all for saying in boxing that you keep it above the belt. But when someone's kicking you below the belt and you're only hitting above the belt, you're not doing – well, you're not fighting as hard. So we should never lie, and we shouldn't ever do anything illegal. But within the limits of the law, we should use our power. And sometimes I think that President Obama didn't use his power enough. And even though he didn't use his power enough, people still complained about him, which tells me that they weren't listening to what he was doing. They weren't following what he was doing. There was not a rational reaction to what they were doing. This was just pure racism, pure emotional racism. These people hated a very moderate judge like Merrick Garland. They hated Obama because he was black, not because of anything he was doing for the country. So this idea that if we fight back hard, we're going to turn people off, I think is still a little naive. I think President Obama should recognize that Republicans have been turning people off with these lies for quite a long time now. And, well, I, I do want to work together with well-meaning Republicans, but there are very few left. And most of them, the well-meaning ones, are leaving government or, in the case of John McCain, dying. It's really, really hard to have cooperation with someone who refuses to cooperate. It's really hard to reach out to someone who keeps slapping your face. Maybe um, we shouldn't turn the other cheek if we're just going to get hit once again. So no, we should never lie. No, we should never violate the law. But within the law, we need to fight robustly. And I think that part of the anger and the excitement in the Democratic Party we see in 2018 is Democrats recognizing that the old ways aren't working anymore. This, yes, sir, we'll work with you Republicans. I'm happy to work with Republicans when they're being reasonable. When they're being unreasonable, we have to fight them all the way. So I'd push back a little against President Obama here. We will play more of his speech, though, when we get back after the break. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Again, I hope you're enjoying the show. Sorry we're not having a lot of calls today. I'm trying to finish the speech. I think it's important to hear it. Uh, but, uh, folks, if you can't get in today, uh, i got a full show on Monday at 3 p.m. We're going to talk about Paul Manafort and um, climate change and the fact that, well, a lot of people in North Carolina are dying because the North Carolina legislator, the con legislators, the conservatives there, passed laws saying they should ignore climate science. Obviously, that helps those oil and gas interests that funnel money to these politicians' campaigns. But if they weren't so blinded by greed, would we have so many people suffering in the hurricane? A lot of people just aren't leaving their homes like they should. Anyway, that'll be the focus on Monday, so please stay tuned for that. And if you call today, call back on Monday. I'll make sure you get on the air. We'll be back shortly, folks. One of these days, I'm going to learn better about Facebook Live. It'd be great if I could 
put Obama's speech up on the screen. Not just play the audio, but have you see the video too. There are video switchers, HDMI video switchers, but if you look into it, they can be exorbitantly astronomically expensive. It should be an easy thing to do just to stick YouTube into Facebook. Um, one, one day it'll happen, just not, not, it doesn't happen yet easily. Coming back, Mark. Okay. Join us. Who says nerds can't be fun? It's Mark Levine. Let me know when you're ready. Ready. You're up. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. One of the things that's very frustrating about fighting terrorism or building up democracy or trying to run a business or even building a sandcastle is that it's a lot easier to tear something down than it is to build something up, right? It might take you hours to build that sandcastle and one good stop and it's over. It might take you months to build a building, but a terrorist with a bomb can destroy it in an instant. And democracy, journalism, getting people to respect the truth, that takes decades of work to get people to trust. And then out comes some big lie, out comes some uh, Joseph Goebbels-like Orwellian tactic. And whole swaths of people just believe in ridiculous lies. They're sheeple, is what I call them, people who are ready to believe in cult-like conspiracy theories, the same kind of people who drink Jim Jones Kool-Aid, believe in the bullshit, a bull, can't say that, the bull <laughs> of an Alex Jones or a Donald Trump. So it's really hard sometimes to build it up. And one of the things that President Obama points out in his speech is that when you're trying to build a country, you're trying to make things work, you're trying to get us out of a recession, you're trying to make people's lives better, that's a lot harder than simply to grasp at power. The totalitarian's job is easier. Not easier to make the country better, no. Authoritarian dictatorship countries generally run into the muck. The authoritarian's job is easier to consolidate power because when you try to build something and include everybody, you're more likely to be criticized. And yet, if you're just out for power and don't give a damn what the people think, the way the Republicans are acting these days, in some ways it's a lot easier. I think he expresses that well right here. You don't need an effective government or a robust press or reasoned debate to work when all you're concerned about is maintaining power. In fact, the more cynical people are about government, the angrier and more dispirited they are about the prospects for change, the more likely the powerful are able to maintain their power. But we believe that in order to move this country forward, to actually solve problems and make people's lives better, we need a well-functioning government. We need our civic institutions to work. We need cooperation among people of different political persuasions. And to make that work, we have to restore our faith in democracy. We have to bring people together, not tear them apart. We need majorities in Congress and state legislatures 
who are serious about governing and want to bring about real change and improvements in people's lives. And we won't win people over by calling them names or dismissing entire chunks of the country as, as racist or sexist or homophobic. When I say bring people together, I mean all of our people. You know, this, this whole notion that has sprung up recently about Democrats need to choose between trying to appeal to white working class voters or voters of color and women and LGBT Americans. That's nonsense. I don't buy that. I got votes from every demographic. We won by reaching out to everybody and competing everywhere and by fighting for every vote. And that's what we've got to do in this election and every election after that. And we can't do that if we immediately disregard what others have to say from the start because they're not like us. Because they're not, because they're white or they're black or they're man or a woman or they're gay or they're straight. If we think that somehow there's no way they can understand how I'm feeling and, and, and therefore don't have any standing to speak on certain matters because we're, we're only defined by certain characteristics. That doesn't work if you want a healthy democracy. I strongly agree with that, by the way. I, I understand some identity politics. I certainly understand the need to have people who look like us, think like us, have our similar characteristics in power so we don't feel we're being deserted. But we should never, ever, ever say, as I was once told at Yale Law School, you can't understand because you're XYZ because you're white or male or female or black or Latino or Jewish or gay or whatever. We're all humans here. And part of the beauty of humanity is that we can recognize each other's humanity. I mean, I have not lived the African American experience, but I know many, many black people and they have shared with me their lives. And because I'm a human being, I'm able to understand lives from their perspectives. And if I'm not, I need to try harder. It's important that all of us try to live in someone else's shoes. That's the only way we can understand each other and work together as Americans. We can't do that if we traffic in absolutes when it comes to policy. Now, to, to make democracy work, we have to be able to get inside the reality of people who are different, have different experiences, come from different backgrounds. We have to engage them even when it is frustrating. We have to listen to them even when we don't like what they have to say. We have to hope that we can change their minds and we have to remain open to them changing ours. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why I bring Republicans on the air why I even go on Fox News, even though I'm well aware I'm walking into the lion's den. I do believe we have to talk to people who differ from us, and I can work across the aisle as I have with Tea Party Senator Amanda Chase on issues like transparency. It's important to work with people of good faith, even people who strongly disagree with us. At the same time, as the president's about to point out, it's important to call out people with bad faith, people who aren't trying to bring us together, people who are merely trying to inflame, people who are lying to us. Those people you don't have to work with. I will work every day with an evangelical who disagrees with most of my values if they're open and honest and trying in good faith to understand. But if someone's acting in bad faith, someone's just trying to change what I say, twist it into some kind of lie, tell me things I know to be untrue. I don't want to work with them, even if they agree with my values. And I think that's an important distinction that needs to be made. And that doesn't mean, by the way, abandoning our principles or caving to bad policy in the interests of maintaining some phony version of civility. That seems to be, by the way, the definition of civility offered by too many uh, congressional Republicans right now. We will be polite so long as we get 100% of what we want and you don't call us out on the various ways that we're sticking it to people. 
and we'll click our tongues and issue vague statements of disappointment when the president does something outrageous, but we won't really actually do anything about it. That's not civility. That's abdicating your responsibilities. But again, I digress. <laughs> Making democracy work means holding on to our principles, having clarity about our principles, and then having the confidence to get in the arena and have a serious debate. And it also means appreciating that progress does not happen all at once, but when you put your shoulder to the wheel, if you're willing to fight for it, things do get better. And, and let me tell you something, particularly young people here. Better is good. I used to have to tell my young staff this all the time in the White House. That's the history of progress in this country. Not perfect, better. The Civil Rights Act didn't end racism, but it made things better. Social Security didn't eliminate all poverty for seniors, but it made things better for millions of people. I'm telling this to people on my left all the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll take 10%, and then I'll take 30%, and then I'll take 50%, and I won't stop fighting for 100%, but don't get down on me for getting 10%. 10% is better than nothing. Better is good. Never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I told this to too many Bernie Sanders supporters who didn't turn around and vote for Hillary in the fall. Good is better than bad, even if it's not perfect. Do not let people tell you the fight's not worth it because you won't get everything that you want. The idea that, well, you know, there's racism in America, so I'm not gonna bother voting, no point. That makes no sense. <laughs> you can make it better. Better is always worth fighting for. That's how our founders expected this system of self-government to work. That through the testing of ideas and the application of reason and evidence and proof, we could sort through our differences and nobody would get exactly what they wanted, but it would be possible to find a basis for common ground. And that common ground exists. Maybe it's not fashionable to say that right now. It's hard to see it with all the nonsense in Washington, and it's hard to hear it with all the noise. But common ground exists. I have seen it. I have lived it. I know there are white people who care deeply about black people being treated unfairly. I have talked to them and loved them. And I know there are black people who care deeply about the struggles of white rural America. I'm one of them and I have a track record to prove it. I know there are evangelicals who are deeply committed to doing something about climate change. I've seen them do the work. I know there are conservatives who think there's nothing compassionate about separating immigrant children from their mothers. I know there are Republicans who believe government should only perform a few minimal functions, but that one of those functions should be making sure nearly 3,000 Americans don't die in a hurricane and its aftermath. <laughs> Common ground's out there. I see it every day. Just how people interact, how people treat each other. You see it on the ball field, you see it at work. You see it in place of worship. 
but to say that common ground exists doesn't mean it will inevitably win out. History shows the power of fear. And the closer that we get to Election Day, the more those invested in the politics of fear and division will work, to, will do anything to hang on to their recent gains. And that's going to be the battle as we get closer to Election Day. The battle of common ground, the battle of Americans working together versus the battle of hate, lies, and fear. The battle of people trying to make America better versus people trying to pad their own pockets and make their lives better, politicians enthralled to the interests of big corporations. That's what the battle is going to be about. And after this break, I'll play more of President Obama's speech as he joins us to fight that battle. Hi, this is John Androsik of Five for Fighting, here for RAD. So hello, Facebook audience. Again, we're going to uh, come close to finishing the speech by the end of the hour. We may not. If not, I will save a little bit of it for Monday. It'll just be a couple of minutes left. I do think it's important to listen to and to really think about the entire speech. If you missed our shows on Tuesday and Thursday, then you missed the early part of the speech. You could certainly find it. I find it by just going YouTube, Barack Obama speech, and looking in the last week. There's there's one on CNN that I've been playing. It's entitled, Former President Obama Unleashes on Trump, GOP, Full Speech from Illinois. That's the one I've been playing. It is the full speech. And I've been reading from a transcript of the speech from USA Today. But if you missed the beginning of the speech, you should know that that he really lays out a lot. He goes to the history of the United States. He points out our periods of common ground and our periods of tearing each other apart. And um, what has worked and what has not worked and points out we've had demagogues in the past, but Americans have risen up to defeat those demagogues. And that's what we're going to have to do in November. That's the call to action that's going to begin as soon as uh, this commercial break is over. But uh, what's sad about it, I, I saw a conservative commentator, one I used to debate on the air, say all kinds of horrible things about Obama. And all the people on his Facebook post were agreeing. And he was attacking the speech. But not a single one of the people, and there were a hundred comments there, and not a single one of the people condemning Obama had listened to the speech, had listened to 30 seconds of the speech. I find that the, op the support of Donald Trump, the opposition to Obama, the opposition, really the Republican Party today is the know-nothing party. Now, that's partly a reference to the party of the 1840s, 1850s that was anti-immigrant. And when asked, what party do you belong to, we're supposed to say, I know nothing because it's a secret party. But it's a play on words. It's a double entendre. It also applies to really this belief that knowing nothing is a good thing. This anti-intellectualism that has really triumphed in the Republican Party, not just on climate science denial, though that's a big one, but on this hatred of people who went to college, people who know things, don't trust those expert economists, don't trust those historians, don't trust those documents, or as Donald Trump would say, don't trust your eyes and ears. Don't believe what you see and hear. Believe my truth, my alternative facts. And if I change my facts, if I say two plus two equals five, you're to believe it. But if I next tell you two plus two equals six, you're to believe that as well. And we become sheeple or followers of Big Brother, if you read 1984. And that's dangerous. 
So yes, people of good faith need to come together. People of different views need to talk with each other. But only people of good faith, people who are willing to listen. If someone condemns a speech they haven't heard, we're coming back, man. I'm ready. Support RDT Daily and the Progressive Voices Network. Remember, we stick together, we win. And now, the voice of reason in an unreasonable world. Mark Let me know when you're ready. Ready. You're up. President Obama ends his speech with a call to action. Hopefully, I'll get to play it all. I may not catch it all. If I don't, I'll play the last remaining minutes on Monday. But I want you to hear as much of it as we can in the time we have left. Fortunately, I am hopeful because out of this political darkness, I am seeing a great awakening of citizenship all across the country. I cannot tell you how encouraged I've been by watching so many people get involved for the first time or the first time in a long time. They're marching and they're organizing and they're registering people to vote and they're running for office themselves. I've seen it myself. It's amazing. Look at this crop of Democratic candidates running for Congress and running for governor, running for the state legislature, running for district attorney, running for school board. It is a movement of citizens who happen to be younger and more diverse and more female than ever before, and that's really useful. We need more women in charge. But we've got first-time candidates. We've got veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, record numbers of women. Americans who previously maybe didn't have an interest in politics as a career, but, but laced up their shoes and rolled up their sleeves and grabbed a clipboard because they, too, believe this time's different. This moment's too important to sit out. And if you listen to what these candidates are talking about in individual races across the country, you'll find they're not just running against something, they are running for something. They're running to expand opportunity, and they're running to restore the honor and compassion that should be the essence of public service. And speaking as a Democrat, that's when the Democratic Party has always made the biggest difference in the lives of the American people when we led with conviction and principle and bold new ideas. The antidote to a government controlled by a powerful few, a government that divides, is a government by the organized, energized, inclusive many. That's what this moment's about. That has to be the answer. You cannot sit back and wait for a savior. That's important. You can't opt out because you don't feel sufficiently inspired by this or that particular candidate. That's very important. This is not a rock concert. This is not Coachella. We don't need a messiah. That's what I told all the people that uh, rejected Hillary Clinton because she wasn't perfect enough. All we need are decent, honest, hardworking people who are accountable and who have America's best interests at heart. And they'll step up and they'll join our government and they will make things better if they have support. One election will not fix everything that needs to be fixed, but it will be a start. And you have to start it. What's going to fix our democracy is you. People ask me, what are you going to do for the election? Now the question is, what are you going to do? You're the antidote. 
your participation and your spirit and your determination, not just in this election, but in every subsequent election and in the days between elections. Because in the end, the, the threat to our democracy doesn't just come from Donald Trump or the current batch of Republicans in Congress or the Koch brothers and their lobbyists or you know, too much compromise from Democrats or Russian hacking. The biggest threat to our democracy is indifference. The biggest threat to our democracy is cynicism. A cynicism that led too many people to turn away from politics and stay home on election day. I agree with him. The biggest threat we face is cynicism. I'll play the end of the speech on Monday, but let me say this. President Obama is saying, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He's asking us to step up. And you know what, friends? Voting is just the start. Canvas for voters. Run for office yourself. Go door to door. Convince your fellow people. This is our time to take back our country. Talk to you on Monday. McGruff, the crime dog here. I deal with a lot of criminal types. And lately... I mean, it will inevitably win out. Good afternoon, America. Oh, pretty, hold on, here you go, Mark. Yeah. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I am your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. A blue wave's a coming. At least that's what they tell us. That's what the pundits tell us. The uh, polls show that we have about a five and six chance we Democrats have taken over the United States House of Representatives. Pretty good. Except, of course, we also had a five and six chance of Hillary Clinton becoming president. This is no time to be complacent. If the Democrats take the House of Representatives, as I do expect we will, I do expect you're going to follow through on your promise to me today to vote, to register to vote if you're not, to get out and canvas and get others to vote and join us. But if we go through with this, we will finally have a House of Representatives that is willing to investigate the president, to discover the dozens, if not hundreds, of crimes, conspiracies, corruption that's going on in the Trump administration by Trump himself, by his whole minions of ne'er-do-wells that he has brought into the White House. If you don't vote, well, the courts may just take away your right to vote. One of the things Republicans really have been striving to do at all levels of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, is to take away your right to vote, to make it virtually impossible or really, really, really hard for young people to vote, for minorities to vote, for poor people to vote, even to design districts to make it so your vote's not counted. Now, the way to stop that would be to take the United States Senate to keep Trump from appointing these dozens, if not, it may be hundreds now, I don't hope it's not gotten to the hundreds, of young, ignorant ideologues, people who would rip up the Constitution in an instant if it meant they could impose their particular religious doctrine down your throats against your will. These are the people who are taking away the right to vote. Remember, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the greatest civil rights act since the Civil War, was thrown out the window. Not because Congress didn't support it. No, it was voted on 98 to 0 by the United States Senate. No, but because five people in black robes said, eh, we don't need blacks to vote anymore. If blacks vote, that'll mean the Democrats will win, and we can't have that, so we're going back to Jim Crow. That happened just a couple of years ago. Barely anyone noticed in the public, but a whole bunch of racist states noticed. A whole bunch of southern states redrew their districts. North Carolina famously drew an incredibly gerrymandered state, which the courts found was racially, intentionally racially gerrymandered, but oh well, too late to fix. I guess we'll just have Jim Crow in North Carolina for another year. It's not like the people of North Carolina need a legislature that represents them. 
After all, this is the exact same legislature in North Carolina in 2012 that said that they were not going to listen to any climate scientists. They were not going to protect the North Carolina coastline from flooding. Climate change was a Chinese hoax, and, well, it would never flood in Wilmington or New Bern. That's because of a North Carolina legislature. To be fair to North Carolinians, it wasn't chosen by the North Carolinian people. The legislature was chosen by the legislature through gerrymandered districts, through Jim Crow laws, through racial gerrymandering, through all the things that used to be illegal under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 until a bunch of right-wing judges who don't give a damn about democracy decided to take away a lot of people's right to vote, including a lot of African-Americans. So your votes matter. They matter this year. There's a one-third chance, according to recent polls, that Democrats could even take the United States Senate and stop this influx of right-wing ideologue judges who promote discrimination. Did you hear Brett Kavanaugh? Did you hear his hearings? Did you hear when he was asked whether or not he believed the United States Supreme Court opinion that said discrimination against gay and lesbian people was a time of the past and didn't belong in our society anymore. And he said, nope, I can't comment on that. Maybe I do support bigotry. Maybe I don't agree with equal protection of the laws. Maybe I would throw out the whole 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the laws. Maybe I believe gay people should be second-class citizens. I ain't going to tell you. I don't have to tell you. We have 51 votes in the Senate. Trump could appoint a dog, and that dog would become justice. It would probably do a lot less damage. Your vote matters. Matters more than ever before. Indeed, it is not an exaggeration to say that if you don't vote now, you may lose your right to vote later, given that Republicans are systematically taking away people's rights to vote. Polls are on our side. In fact, if my home state of Virginia is any indication, and I think it is, the blue wave, we were the tip of the spear in November 2017, and we're going to spread that all throughout the country. Governorships matter. We can get 20-something governorships. Right now, the Republicans have, throughout the country, a majority of states completely under their control. But we can change that. In fact, this is our last chance to change that prior to the redistricting of 2021 after the 2020 census, which in itself is going to be undercounted because the Trump administration is trying to purposely undercount minorities. Remember, this is a administration and a party of white people by white people and for white people. Well, certain kinds of white people. White Christian evangelical billionaires who are male. God knows they don't care much about women, given that their candidate, um, well, they want to rush him through, even though there are quite credible allegations that he tried to rape a woman. Let's see if she gets her voice before the vote scheduled on Thursday. Hope she does. The point is, a blue wave's a coming if you make it come, if you help it come. If you do your part. All last week I've been playing a speech by President Obama, a very powerful speech, going through the history of the United States, going through why this particular administration is so anti-American. Frankly, that's one of the kinder things I can say about administration that, as far as I'm concerned, has shown treachery in addition to corruption and narcissism and frankly, just not caring about Americans or just lying about them. Yeah, 3,000, 4,000 Puerto Ricans dead. We don't care. They're brown. I'm angry. And I think you should be too. I want to play the end of that speech by President Obama. When we come back from the break, it'll be the end of the speech. I think he gives a very powerful exhortation to vote. And I want you to hear from the president. I also want to talk about Kavanaugh, uh, Tropical Storm Florence, climate change, the flip of Manafort, 
the growing success of Robert Mueller, the Woodward book. We have a lot on our plate. We won't finish today, but if you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275. And if not, we got a lot more to talk about on Thursday. We'll be right back right after this. Rumor has it he quotes the Constitution in his sleep. Is it super nerd? No, it's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's Just so I can figure out time, Mark, we're coming back at uh, three twenty around sharp, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I wanted to play a little bit more of this, but Let's see if I can get to the You can't opt out because. Just don't have enough time. I guess I can cut out the very end of the speech. I think I'll have to do it in two blocks. All right, I'll do it in two blocks. I don't really have a choice. You see it on the ball field. You see it at work. You see it in places of worship. But to say that common ground exists doesn't mean it will inevitably win out. No, Eric, I don't know that uh, Kavanaugh assaulted anyone in law school. Can't say I know that. I want to be clear. <laughs> I only overlap with Kavanaugh one year in law school. Uh, he's a couple years older than I am. Or so. Um... Deborah, I am just fine, thank you. The storm um, went south of us and devastated the Carolinas and mostly left Virginia alone, definitely left Northern Virginia alone. It actually hit um, some of the areas uh, the Southwest and a um, little bit near the coast, but Deborah, uh, but um, Virginia was largely spared. North Carolina took the brunt of it. That same legislature, that same state where the legislature decided to ignore all the warnings. Back to the aggressive progressive, Mark Levine. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. 
Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the blue wave, which may or may not be coming in seven weeks. Well, President Obama, uh, in his speech, tells us why it's so important that we get out and vote. And I want to play the end of that speech now and a little bit after the next segment. History shows the power of fear. And the closer that we get to Election Day, the more those invested in the politics of fear and division will work, to, will do anything to hang on to their recent gains. Fortunately, I am hopeful because out of this political darkness, I am seeing a great awakening of citizenship all across the country. I cannot tell you how encouraged I've been by watching so many people get involved for the first time, or the first time in a long time. They're marching, and they're organizing, and they're registering people to vote, and they're running for office themselves. Look at this crop of Democratic candidates running for Congress, and running for governor, running for the state legislature, running for district attorney, running for school board. It is a movement of citizens who happen to be younger and more diverse and more female than ever before, and that's really useful. We need more women in charge. But we've got first-time candidates, we've got veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, record numbers of women, Americans who previously maybe didn't have an interest in politics as a career, but, but laced up their shoes and rolled up their sleeves and grabbed a clipboard because they too believe this time's different. This moment's too important to sit out. I've seen it too. Most of you know I'm a state legislator in Virginia. I'm a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. And we've seen this. We, we were the, uh, I think, the tip of the spear. In 2017, we thought if we won five or six seats in the Virginia legislature, that would be expected. If we won eight or 10, that'd be fantastic. And we won 15. Actually, we won enough to put ourselves in the majority, except for Republican gerrymandering and some couple court cases where they said that people don't really deserve a right to vote. Remember I told you those federal... Republican judges, don't give a damn about your right to vote. But we saw it in Virginia. We saw grassroots movements. In my city, there were one or two. Now there are more than a dozen, more than I can count. People getting involved for the first time. People who sat out races year after year after year, happily complacent about their country, and then Trump came. It's the one thing, the one good thing Donald Trump has done this great blue awakening. And don't think the Republicans aren't voting. They voted in greater numbers too, far greater numbers. They increased their numbers by some 20%. We increased our numbers by some 60%. There are a lot of progressive leaning people, a lot of anti-Trump people that just don't vote. They have to vote. And Barack Obama is right. Record numbers of women. In the Virginia House of Delegates, Half the Democrats are now women because of those 15 that won, 11 were women, four were men. One was a woman whose vote was denied, uh, even by a uh, coin flip. In Virginia, again, of our seven candidates running against our seven Republicans, six are women. Now, I'm not saying that only women are good for government. I certainly have run myself, but women are good and are better than most men because they look at things, I think, in a different way. I think having more women in the government means more concern for the rights of women, more concern for matters of the heart, for caring about people. Not saying that men don't care, but the women who are there, I think, well, any diverse group, Legislators should represent the people they represent. And unfortunately, too many white male evangelical billionaires who are straight don't understand what it's like to be poor 
or what it's like to be female or black or Latino or Asian or gay or transgender or a woman in America. So it is exciting to see all that crowd coming out. And if you listen to what these candidates are talking about in individual races across the country, you'll find they're not just running against something, they are running for something. They're running to expand opportunity and they're running to restore the honor and compassion that should be the essence of public service. And speaking as a Democrat, that's when the Democratic Party has always made the biggest difference in the lives of the American people when we led with conviction and principle and bold new ideas. The antidote to a government controlled by a powerful few, a government that divides, is a government by the organized, energized, inclusive many. That's what this moment's about. That has to be the answer. You cannot sit back and wait for a savior. You can't opt out because you don't feel sufficiently inspired by this or that particular candidate. This is not a rock concert. This is not Coachella. We don't need a messiah. All we need are decent, honest, hardworking people who are accountable and who have America's best interests at heart. And they'll step up and they'll join our government and they will make things better if they have support. One election will not fix everything that needs to be fixed, but it will be a start. And you have to start it. What's gonna fix our democracy is you. People ask me, what are you gonna do for the election? Now the question is, what are you gonna do? You're the antidote, your participation and your spirit and your determination, not just in this election, but in every subsequent election. What are you going to do in this election? The antidote is you. Don't sit back and wait for a messiah. Don't opt out because you're not particularly inspired by this candidate. We don't need a messiah. We have to pick people who are going to hold the government accountable. And right now, the only people holding the government accountable are Democrats. The few Republicans that want to hold the government accountable are leaving government or have just died. What are you going to do to save your country? This is your chance. We'll play the conclusion of President Obama's speech after this. My name is Mira Bhatt.
hello again, Facebook audience. By the way, please do not message me during the broadcast. I'm trying to turn off the um, the notification. That's what that little bell is. But I can't do that because I'm playing Obama's speech from the same computer. I'll mute it after I uh, finish with Obama's speech. Feel free to leave comments. Be back shortly. Hey, Mark, just heads up to check Messenger. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take him um, at the end of the broadcast. Okay, I'll let him know. And now, the voice of reason in an unreasonable world. Mark Levine. Ready? Ready. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. So much to talk about. We're going to do more of the week's uh, events this Thursday. But before, I just need to finish President Obama. He's telling us something really simple, really obvious, and yet vitally important. The question is not what he's going to do in this election. The question is, what are you going to do? How are you going to help? I do. I have support. One election will not fix everything that needs to be fixed, but it will be a start. And you have to start it. What's going to fix our democracy is you. People ask me, what are you going to do for the election? Now the question is, what are you going to do? You're the antidote, your participation and your spirit and your determination, not just in this election, but in every subsequent election and in the days between elections. Because in the end, the, the threat to our democracy doesn't just come from Donald Trump or the current batch of Republicans in Congress or the Koch brothers and their lobbyists, or you know, too much compromise from Democrats, or Russian hacking. The biggest threat to our democracy is indifference. The biggest threat to our democracy is cynicism. A cynicism that led too many people to turn away from politics and stay home on election day. 
to all the young people who are here today. There are now more eligible voters in your generation than in any other, which means your generation now has more power than anybody to change things. If you want it, you can make sure America gets out of its current funk. If you actually care about it, you have the power to make sure we seize a brighter future. But to exercise that clout, to, to exercise that power, you have to show up. In the last midterms election, in 2014, fewer than one in five young people voted. One in five, not two in five, or three in five, one in five. Is it any wonder this Congress doesn't reflect your values and your priorities? Are, are you surprised by that? This whole project of self-government only works if everybody's doing their part. Don't tell me your vote doesn't matter. I've, I've won states in the presidential election because of five, 10, 20 votes per precinct. And if you thought elections don't matter, I hope these last two years have corrected that impression. This is a powerful point. Young people are not represented, their issues are not represented, whether it's college costs, whether it's healthcare costs, whether it's their values. Young people are by and large less racist, less discriminatory, less homophobic, more tolerant of differences, more supportive of immigrants, more supportive of the American dream, less supportive of pollution, more supportive of the environment, less supportive of big corporations than the average American. But if only one in five are voting, you can see, as the president says, why Congress does not reflect your priorities. So if you don't like what's going on right now, and you shouldn't, <laughs> do not complain. Don't hashtag, don't get anxious, don't retreat, don't binge on whatever it is you're binging on, don't lose yourself in ironic detachment, don't put your head in the sand, don't boo, vote, vote. If you are really concerned about how the criminal justice system treats African-Americans, the best way to protest is to vote. Not just for senators and representatives, but for mayors and sheriffs and state legislators. Do what they just did in Philadelphia and Boston and elect state's attorneys and district attorneys who are looking at issues in a new light who realize that the vast majority of law enforcement do the right thing in a really hard job. And we just need to make sure all of them do. If you're tired of politicians who offer nothing but thoughts and prayers after a mass shooting, you've got to do what the Parkland kids are doing. Some of them aren't even eligible to vote yet. They're out there working to change minds and registering people. And they're not giving up until we have a Congress that sees your lives as more important than a campaign check from the NRA. You've got to vote. If you support the Me Too movement, you're outraged by stories of sexual harassment and assault inspired by the women who shared them. You've got to do more than retweet a hashtag. You've got to vote. Part of the reason women are more vulnerable in the workplace is because not enough women are bosses in the workplace. 
which is why we need to strengthen and enforce laws that protect women in the workplace, not just from harassment, but from discrimination in hiring and promotion and not getting paid the same amount for doing the same work. That requires laws. Laws get passed by legislators. You've got to vote. When you vote, you've got the power to make it easier to afford college and harder to shoot up a school. When you vote, you've got the power to make sure a family keeps its health insurance. You could save somebody's life. When you vote, you've got the power to make sure white nationalists don't feel emboldened to march with their hoods off or their hoods on in Charlottesville in the middle of the day. minutes. 30 minutes of your time. Is, is, is democracy worth that? Actually, it often takes less than 30 minutes, really. Polling places, I find um, only in the morning does it ever take 30 minutes. We've managed, at least in Virginia, to keep lines way down now. I have a cousin, big Bernie supporter, young man. I won't use his name. I won't embarrass him. He's probably 20, 23 or so. Out there, out there hustling for Bernie. But when it came to the election, the general election, he didn't like Hillary. He didn't vote. Now he's out there hashtagging and he's horribly anti-Trump, but He's part of the reason Trump is there. And when you don't vote in the presidential race, or you don't vote because, oh, your senator, you're sure is going to win. What about your member of Congress? What about your state delegates? What about your state legislators? Hopefully, I persuaded you that state legislators matter. Your local government matters. We're the ones who draw the district lines. You don't like gerrymandering? Vote. Vote up and down the line. We have been through much darker times than these. And somehow each generation of Americans carried us through to the other side. Not by sitting around and waiting for something to happen. Not by leaving it to others to do something. But by leading that movement for change themselves. And if you do that, if you get involved and you get engaged and you knock on some doors and you talk with your friends and you argue with your family members and you change some minds and you vote, something powerful happens. Change happens. Hope happens. Not perfection. Not every bit of cruelty and sadness and poverty and disease suddenly stricken from the earth. There'll still be problems, but, but with each new candidate that surprises you with a victory, that you supported us, a spark of hope happens. With each new law that helps a kid read or helps uh, a homeless family find shelter or helps a, a veteran get the support he or she has earned. Each time that happens, hope happens. With each new step we take in the direction of fairness and justice and equality and opportunity, hope spreads. And that can be the legacy of your generation. You can be the generation that at a critical moment stood up and reminded us just how precious this experiment in democracy really is. Just how powerful it can be when we fight for it, when we believe in it. I believe in you. I believe you will help lead us in the right direction, and I will be right there with you every step of the way. Thank you, Illinois. God bless you. God bless this country we love. Thank you.
So there you have it. I played the speech in full over the past week because there was so much meat there. But the heart of it is, well, an exhortation to vote. And you know what? Voting isn't enough. Yes, of course. That's the minimum. That's the absolute minimum price you pay to live in a free country. And if you're not willing to pay that minimum, you really don't deserve to live here. And I mean that. But you can do so much more. You ever canvassed? Do you know what that even means? Go door to door. Ask people to vote. If you don't like going door to door, you can call up people. Bunch of phone numbers, people who don't vote every election. Do you know how to do it? Do you know what to do? You can find that political candidate you like so much. Go to their website. They'd love to have volunteers. You can join your local Democratic Party. Unlike the Republican Party, which is very top-down, Koch brothers give hundreds of millions of dollars. Sheldon Adelson gives so many hundred million dollars. They've got like five or six donors that finance the vast majority of what they do. Democratic Party's grassroots, it's ground up. I've been a member of the Alexander Democratic Committee for longer than I can remember. Are you a member of your local Democratic Party? Do you know how easy it is to join? One of the things that always bugged me about some of the activists in the Democratic primaries, the Bernie Hillary primaries, they would say, the Democratic Party made this unfair. And I said, well, what's the Democratic Party? If you think the Democratic Party is top down, then you don't know anything about the Democratic Party. Will Rogers famously said, I'm not a member of any organized party. I'm a Democrat. Democratic Party is ground up. You can join your local party. You can be a part. You don't like how the DNC is run, the Democratic National Committee. They're elected from your local party. Show up at the meetings. Meet other people who believe like you do. It actually gets to be fun to work with your fellow Americans for a cause. And whether it's going door to door, whether it's writing postcards, whether it's calling people, whether it's working on a social media campaign, wouldn't it be great to know that you were part of the big blue wave? That when the tsunami swept the country and good people chased out bad people and corruption went down and this racist, disgusting government was weakened and the people got their voice again and democracy. Wouldn't it be nice to know that you were a part of this critical moment in your nation's history? Yeah, you got to vote. President Obama asked you to vote. I'm asking you to do more. You can spare two hours on a weekend, weeknight. You can make some phone calls. You can get out there or, and call those friends of yours. You know the ones. Maybe they're not registered. There's not much time to register. They only got a couple weeks. It's really easy to do, though. You can get the registration form online or at the post office. You know those friends of yours, the ones that occasionally vote but agree with you? Have you guilted someone lately? Have you guilted a good friend or family member who you know is a Democrat and just doesn't always get around to voting? The blue wave will happen only if you and I and all people of goodwill in America make it happen. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. I'll be right back right after this. Back to the aggressive. He's a Bible quoting, Constitution loving, flag waving, red blooded liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888 488 Mark. That's 888 488 6275. Okay, we've got Michael from the Bronx on the line. Yes, sir. And that's it. We'll take him. And, and he w yeah, said he's good to hold. Okay.
So that's true. Just read the tweet. I was around when this happened to uh, Anita Hill. I remember it well. I was in law school at the time. Yeah, see, I I read about it, you know, after the fact. So it's it's uh. Oh, this is searing. Yeah. Thing about it is. The allegation is so specific. Oh, exactly. You know, people don't make up stuff like this. No, exactly. Uh, plus, she talked about it in 2012 when Obama was president. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it looks and like she's she got a polygraph, be... too. I mean, right. <laughs> is he willing to take a polygraph? I'd love to see that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that'd be great. Plus, and if there's time, I'll talk about it on the air. The guy that um, was there, too, who can't really admit it because, mm -hmm. frankly, he'd be in uh, incriminating himself to yeah. the crime of rape, um, doesn't say it didn't happen. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Wow. What he says is, I don't have any recollection of it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a different thing. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to say this on the air, but I can safely say that I have never done that in my entire yeah, life. Yeah, like, shouldn't you be able to say that, <laughs> right? Right. I have never held someone down and forced them to have sex with me. Yeah, ever. come on. Nor have I ever seen it happen. Yeah, that you think I'm, you'd remember I'm that, you know? I'm, I'm confident if it had happened, I would remember it and I would have reported it. Yeah, exactly. Maybe it's not a recollection because it happened to him all the time. Well, there were 38 times that happened. Well, you remember. never know. You know, all my friends said that. The other thing, um, I got to find what this guy wrote. It's the friend. He wrote a book about being drunk in college. Hold on, let me find it. He wrote a memoir. Oh, he's got it right here. Wasted Tales of a Gen X Drunk. His time as a teen. Okay, I'll read about this. I'll, I'll answer Mark's, uh, Michael's question quickly, and I'll end with this. Sounds good. And now, the voice of hey, Mark. in Ready. the Here unreasonable you go. world, Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Let's go right to Old Faithful, Michael from the Bronx. How are you, Michael? Hey, hey, Mark. You know something? The Republicans, I know you're going to talk about this more, they got real serious problems with this Kavanaugh um, thing because for them to say that, oh, now this information, this rape allegation comes up at the last minute. Remember this, Republicans, you were the ones that dumped a bunch of documents to um, That's right. That's right. That, that's a great point, Michael. How, the irony. Here they dumped 42,000 documents at 11 p.m. before a 9 a.m. hearing, and they're like, and but, dem but Democrats. Yeah, but you're telling us at the last minute, of course, what really happened is uh, it was reported back in July to Dianne Feinstein. Uh, the woman at the time asked to be anonymous, to be confidential, mm -hmm. and Feinstein kept it confidential until the woman decided herself that she could no longer keep it confidential. I'm going to just thank you and hang up on you quickly, Michael, more. because I've got, I've got, I want to finish on this point. Uh, but thank you for calling. The, there is a witness to this crime, and this witness needs to be investigated by the FBI. It is a crime to lie to the FBI. Now, he may want to plead the fifth. But there was someone else in the room. His name was Mark Judge, ironically, uh, who attended Georgetown Prep with the nominee. Now, Mark Judge doesn't do the case well. Remember, this is a very specific allegations that Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge were drunk 
and that he climbed on top of her, Brett Kavanaugh did, and tried to remove her bathing suit, couldn't do it, and that the music was so loud she couldn't scream, and she tried to, and he held his hand over her mouth, and she was afraid he would accidentally kill her, and she would suffocate during the attempted rape. Now, Mark Judge has not denied this happened. What he says is he doesn't remember it happened. But this is a guy who also wrote a book, an addiction memoir, in 1997 entitled Wasted Tales of a Gen X Drunk. And in that book, this is a direct quote from the book, after a night of heavy drinking in a Georgetown bar, quote, the next thing I knew I was lying on a bathroom floor. I was curled up in the fetal position with saliva running out of the side of my mouth. He doesn't know how he got to the Four Seasons Hotel. He must have come over there and passed out. Maybe he doesn't really remember. But I'll tell you something. I would remember such a thing. I can safely tell you I have never been on top of anyone forcing them to have sex with me against their will, ever male or female. That's the kind of thing I'd remember. It all rings true. He talks about the fact that he and Brett Kavanaugh got drunk all the time together. In fact, Kavanaugh's even mentioned in the book under a barely disguised pseudonym called Bart O. Kavanaugh. These allegations have to be investigated. I remember Anita Hill. I'm confident Clarence Thomas did what he did. I'll tell you why in another broadcast. If we have any hope for equality in America, we need to investigate this claim. It's Mark Levine signing off. Great show, Mark. Just a reminder to do the re-jiggering of the cord.